Hi, Phoebs. Get to that mute button eventually. Hi, Gail. <laughs> How are you? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, you sound great. Okay, it's good. Encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, because my other device won't charge, and that's the one where it works better. So I find that okay. if I take myself off camera, it might work a bit better. Well, it's nice to see you because we don't usually get to see your face. <laughs> I have the same issue. My internet's not particularly strong. So, yes, yeah, sometimes I end up going off video just so my voice voice doesn't cut out on people, but I'll stay on video as long as it's working. Y'all just tell me if it becomes an issue because it is nice to be able okay. to see people's faces. <laughs> yeah. Make sure everything is working. Mm, same. Mm -hmm. That's good. Chat. Say testing. 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 Good. Okay. That's great. So cool. far. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers and toes crossed. That's all you can do. Totally. Hi, Thieves. It's Mariana. How are you? Hi, Mariana. <laughs> Yay, hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, I'll be same waiting around. Yeah. Good. Oh, we're only a few minutes out. I trust we'll fill in here quickly enough. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just take the chance to finish my lunch. <laughs> yeah, enjoy. <laughs>
Hi, Amy. Hi, Emma. Hi, Phoebs. Hey there. Happy Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Hi, Emma. Hello. I think my cat is going to insist on coming to the meeting today, so we're just going to just have to put up with fuzzy cuteness. So sorry, everybody. <laughs> hey, Dave. Hello. Neat. What do you have there, Phoebs? This is Stuart. Stuart. Uh, He's our rescue cat from New Hampshire. Nice. He's like seven years old, seven years old. and he had three rounds at the rounds at the, the pound for somebody was it before he was able to stick to a house. We've had him for seven months and it's going pretty great. I'm also picking up a slight echo, so I think we'll have to be careful as always <laughs> with muting when we're not talking. We're not talking. Technology. All right. Great. Well, it's great to see folks are joining in. We're at the top of the hour. We're scheduled to go from 1 p.m. till 4 p.m. today. So we have three hours ahead of us. Um, just dropping back in the chat because I don't know if folks can see the chat before they joined, but um, Hopefully you're here for the joint meeting of Vermont's Environmental Justice Advisory Council and Interagency Committee. Um, if not, you're welcome to stay, but we'll be offended if you leave. Um, this is open to the public and uh, as all of our kind of proceedings are together and uh, that means that we are required to record all of our meetings together. So just be aware that this meeting is actively being recorded and will be posted on our website. Um, within a few days of the meeting. So yeah, I just want folks to be aware of that. Um, we'll go around and we'll do introductions, uh, check in and see who all are here. Um, I think what I want to do is have us kind of do it roll call style just so that um, we are acknowledging who's not in the room with us. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and um, just sort of drop a list of our advisory council and interagency committee members into the chat here. Um, and we can just check in about who's here or not here and all good if folks join in a few minutes late. Um, it's helpful to know where we're at with quorum. I know it took us a minute in our last meeting to reach quorum, um, which means we have two sets of prior meeting minutes to approve today. So hopefully we can get that done today. Um, great. So yeah, I'd love for us to just go around um, and just share, you know, have our advisory council and our interagency committee members Go around first and just share your name, pronouns, any other identifiers that are important to you, and just sort of what role you play on the committee. Um, and then I'm going to invite us to use the same prompts that we've been using because I think it's healthy to practice um, and just a nice way to drop in with each other, which is just saying a word or two of gratitude for one of the non-human parts of our environment and ecosystem that we uh, we're appreciating today. So I can kick off and then I'm going to pass off to our, our list in the chat. Um, so I'm Phoebes Potter. Um, I am one of the environmental justice coordinators hired within the Agency of Natural Resources to coordinate um, and provide technical support to the two groups that are meeting today. So I'll be facilitating. Um, and oh, today I am feeling a lot of gratitude for um, my quickly growing flock of baby chickens who every day at 530 take me from being kind of grumpy that I'm up to extraordinarily happy that I'm that I'm up and um, that's what I'm spending gratitude to today because they're cute and I will pass to Jennifer. 
Hi there, I'm Jennifer Byrne. I'm on the EJ Advisory Council uh, representing the Conservation District's um, overarching agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Council. Um, I work for the White River Natural Resource Conservation District, and I'm very grateful for all the leaves um, decomposing and growing our topsoil right now. Yes, love, love it. Um, Zariah, are you with us? Okay. We'll just circle back. Um, okay. Rich, I see you. Good morning, Rich. We're just uh, introducing ourselves, our role on the committee, our council, and one thing we're grateful for, one non-human part of our ecosystem and environment that we're feeling grateful for today. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm Rich, Rich Holshu, many of us have met before from down in what you know as Brattleboro. And uh, I am a representative here for the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs. Um, and I am a citizen of El Nuevo Beneke. What I am grateful for, um, I think that was the prompt from the environment. Is that, is that right, Phoebes? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. I am glad to see uh, grandfather son come up again this morning. Um, we we look for that and we can't take it for granted. So I'm grateful for this. Thank you, Rich. Um, Brittany, Brittany, are you with us? Okay, I'm gonna jump to Gail. Gail was on earlier. Hopefully she's still connected. And we even tested audio and everything. Um, OK, we'll just take a minute. That's fine. Hopefully we can um, get her back online. If she's not with us still, I'll double check on that. Um, Kaya, are you able to be with us today? Um, then let's jump to Mariana. Yes, I'm here. Hello, everybody. This is Mariana Sears. I use she and her pronouns, and I work with Hunger Free Vermont. I'm the Food Security Advisor for the Environmental Justice Committee, and I enjoy a lot meeting with all of you <clears throat> and getting to know more of us and uh, starting to to take shape. I'm, I'm excited about the work we're doing together. Um, I have to be grateful for the rain. I know that it's hard to be grateful for the rain after weeks and weeks of seeing it, but still, it's part of Mother Nature, it's part of the cycle, is is what we need if we have it. So, yes, grateful for the rain. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. Um, Reverend Brownridge. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Walter Brownridge. Um, he, him, they pronouns. Um, I work for uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont, and I'm representative of one of the protected or um, uh, groups um, for this work as a member of the um, Environmental Justice Council, thanks to the Speaker of the House. And I am grateful, um, this may sound strange, I'm grateful actually that we in Vermont are part of a very large ecosystem, you know, uh, in a way of a connection <laughs> in this country of the Appalachian Trail. Um, that is connected. I was um, last week. I was in Tennessee for several days at a board meeting uh, of a university that I'm a member of the board of trustees of. And the comments everyone always asks me because I used to work at that school. Um, how do I like Vermont? And um, we all made the similar context that 
you know, it's really just the opposite end of the Appalachian, not quite the fully, because it's in Maine, I know, but going through the, the sort of northern part of that trail and um, uh, the various mountains and hills and uh, wilderness that uh, it transgresses through um, and how there are similarities in uh, issues uh, that imp impact um, particularly the vulnerable groups, um, whether in Tennessee or Virginia or Pennsylvania or Vermont and so on. So I'm grateful that we live in that space. And um, for me, um, gratitude is the first motivation for effort, for work to respond. So that's where I'm at today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't believe Susanna is able to join today. I just saw a note from um, Shalini as well. I know they're preparing for their exciting event this coming weekend. So, um, so let's jump ahead. Um, Mariam, are you with us? Hi, everyone. My name is Mariam Shabir Abbasi, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I work part time with University of Vermont School as a program coordinator, and I also work at Lowe's store to uh, meet expenses. Uh, I'm a bit behind uh, whatever was going on. I couldn't be in the last meeting because I told peeps before leaving that I'm going to Pakistan for a month. So um, glad to be here, uh, but also peeps is wanted to let you know that Mondays are never okay for me. So I would be leaving in one and a half hour. I would be able to attend that. After that, I have to go to store for work. Um, and that's all uh, with the hope that I would be able to catch up whatever I have missed. I'm glad to be here again. Thanks, Mary. I'm glad you can make it too. And um, apologies for the conflict. Keep trying to work work through those. Um, I know Trey is, is uh, unable to join today. He's not feeling well. Um, he let me know. But I saw Gail pop back on the screen. Gail, are you able to check in? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I'm having technical difficulties with both devices. My name is Gail Pezzo. I am the uh, president of the Westbury Homeowners Association. Uh, board. I've also just been recently appointed to the mobile home task force. Um, and I am grateful that it appears that this device is working at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Gail. Um, great. Anybody from the advisory council who has made it on and has not been able to check in yet? OK, we are up to six folks, so we are at a quorum. Um, so yeah, let's turn over to the interagency committee. Um, Claire. Hi, everyone. Uh, Claire McElveny. I use she or her pronouns. I'm a data and equity policy manager at the Department of Public Service. Um, and I, in terms of what I've been grateful for, have been really grateful for experiencing nature through the eyes of my year and a half year old golden retriever. Um, I just feel like she is so joyful and curious whenever she goes out in the woods. It just makes me wanna embody that spirit even more than I would otherwise be when you're all caught up in life. So that's what I've been grateful for recently. Claire. Um, Sabina and or Jenny. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Ronis. Sabina can't make it today. Uh, I'm Associate General Counsel for the Natural Resources Board, which is the state agency that does Act 250. Um, she, her pronouns, and I am grateful for uh, how many different types of color we've been getting sort of progressing through with the leaves. I thought we had peak color like two weeks ago and it just keeps showing me something different out my window every day. And so I'm grateful for that. Thank you. 
to Jenny uh, Gretel. Hi everyone, um, I'm Gretel St. Lawrence, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the environmental specialist at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And I think I'm grateful for walking and biking to see everything that's around me recently. Um, Amy. Oh, good. Hi, everyone. Amy Redman. I use she, her pronouns. I am a health equity lead at the Department of Health. And gosh, this is, I love this question. Something I'm grateful for is um, the, the leaves have started to fall here uh, in Huntington, where I live. And it opens up this kind of like expansive view of the landscape and the some of the ridges, the hills uh, around my house. And as we kind of head into the darker months, um, I feel grateful to be able to like have this expansiveness and like see the changing landscape and sometimes feel that it also is like happening internally as well. So i um, just feeling really grateful for this time. And I like the dark darkening uh, for some reason. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, Stephanie? Okay, I think we have Stephanie with us. Um, Nuvik. Hi, Nuvik Malimbani. Uh, I am the NIP state coordinator of uh, OEAWE. And uh, the things I am grateful today is, you know, I'm glad of uh, you know uh, what is happening around me, and uh, also enjoying uh, this beautiful weather uh, that we have uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Hi, everyone. I'm Abby Willard. I use she/her pronouns. I'm the Division Director for Ag Development at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. So I'm a member of the Interagency Committee. And I'm going to put a photo in the chat for what I'm grateful for, just for mixing it up a little bit. I went for this kind of unexpected but fun walk in the rain in North Hero, and we came across this like wetland area and this site, which I believe is a green heron rookery, which I've never actually seen before, but there was like 50 nests in these like standing um flooded almost dead trees and i just really appreciated we're actually on a road and if you look to the left you see that photo if you look to the right there were also lots of standing dead trees but no nests so just really appreciating um the great blue herons that choose to live in such community with one another thanks abby carla Good afternoon, um, Carla Raimundi, she, her. Um, I am grateful for the display of colors as the chlorophyll fades away. Um, and I have particular appreciation because as Amy mentioned, um, the darker months are coming. But there's this wonderful display of just gorgeous colors and so vibrant. So as to say, appreciate me. I am blooming, you know, the up, but uh, showing this gorgeous colors and then just the whiteness. So I'm just very appreciative for the colors um, of the season. Thanks, Carla. Dave and Isaac. Hi, uh, Dave Pelletier here. I'm representing the Agency of Transportation on the Interagency Committee. Um, he, him pronouns. Uh, I work in the planning policy and planning um, section at AOT. And um, following the theme, I'm just uh, generally speaking grateful for the, the change of seasons and just the um, the ever changing and kind of uh, dynamic landscape that we live in here, and just that rhythm and and pattern and cycle that it um, that it provides us over the course of the year to kind of I don't know to just kind of provide a little bit of a marker here and there and kind of um, something to to measure time with a little bit. 
Um, and I have uh, with me today uh, my colleague Isaac, who works in the same section with me. Isaac, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Isaac Kaplan. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I work with Dave uh, at the Agency of Transportation as a systems planning coordinator. Um, and something I'm grateful for, I went hiking yesterday around Mount Mansfield and appreciative of the beautiful trails and some cool moss. Some thanks. And Elizabeth. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Schilling. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Vermont Public Utility Commission. Uh, and I am grateful for the fall migration and getting to see uh, bird species that we don't get to see all year round. Uh, but that's fun. Thanks, Elizabeth. Great. Um, Okay, so just one more last call for any other advisory council or interagency committee members who haven't had a chance to say hi yet. Okay, um, I do want to take a minute and just acknowledge some of the other staff from the Agency of Natural Resources who are with us today just because they do a lot of work behind the scenes to make this come together and um, Carla, of course, you know, is here as an interagency committee member, but also is my supervisor and provides a ton of support in preparing these meetings and organizing. So gratitude to her for that. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Emma Ramirez -Ricker, Richer, who's on the call, if you want to say hi. Emma, in particular, I want to introduce because she's stepped up to support um, with just managing sort of the admin side of things and per diem processing and um, some support around that. So anybody who's thinking about your per diem processing that uh, it had been Alex supporting that, Emma stepped in in that role. And I just dropped a link in the chat just as a reminder where everyone can find all the information about per diems and things like that. So um, Emma, if you want to take a minute and say hi, you're welcome to do that. Hello, I'm Emma. Um, and the executive assistant here at uh, Agency of Natural Resources. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to be a point person. I think that my email is probably in that document that Phoebe's just put in the chat, but um, I'm Emma, she, her, and grateful for good health during this fall season. Thanks, Emma. Um, I also want to recognize Emily Rogers and Megan Cousineau, who are in the Department of Environmental Conservation, who were involved in the presentation we got at our last meeting and just provide me with a lot of uh, our team with a lot of sort of supplemental expertise and knowledge and administrative support. Um, Emily's taking notes today. So just big shout out to both of you. Thank you. Um, and then to Rachel Stevens, who you'll hear from throughout the meeting today, um, Associate General Counsel um, here to provide legal support to this work. So um, hopefully that's I think rounds out our A&R team. And then I would just like to welcome members of the public. Um, you're welcome either in the chat or out loud to introduce yourself um, just so we know uh, who's decided to share space with us today. No pressure. OK. Um, I will acknowledge we're going to go over the agenda. Oh, I forgot. Sophie, um, that's the other person I want to introduce who's new to the Agency of Natural Resources team. Sophie is actually the new community engagement and um, communications coordinator with the Climate Action Office. So she's fresh in that role, but I just wanted to acknowledge that our teams are really working closely together to make sure we're being thoughtful about how community engagement is coordinated um, around both what we're working on here with environmental justice issues and with the climate. Climate Action Office, um, knowing these issues are deeply intertwined and um, so she'll be bringing some great resources, I think, to, to the agency in general to help make sure that we can do our part around community engagement more effectively. So hi, Sophie. Um, yeah. All right. All right. So with that, since we we're already well past the time I had planned for just this part of the agenda, and I think it's going to be one of those days, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and bring us into our PowerPoint to kind of facilitate what we're doing with the meeting. Um, give me a second to load this. The first thing I just want to make sure we do is review our community agreements together. Um, be great if five folks would volunteer to read our five community agreements. Uh, let's like pop screen. OK. 
can use your hand, raise your hand if you're willing to do that. Abby, great. Go ahead with number one. OK, I'm happy to do number one. Uh, be present with yourself and one another. Be present with your body and feelings. If you need to take a break or take care of yourself, please do. Be present for one another by listening deeply. Thanks. Elizabeth? Uh, calling in and calling out. Assume best intent, but attend to impact. We can stop things that are being said that are hurtful and be curious and create a space for learning. Tools include using oops, ouch, to indicate a pause as needed. Thanks. Gretel? Uh, number three, expect and accept non-closure. We are unlikely to leave here feeling 100% ready to go or, or to have everything on our agenda wrapped up, especially if we are committed to moving at the speed of trust. Rich. Number four, center respect. Be respectful, intentional, and work to build trust and create a safe and inviting space. Thanks, and Nuvik? Number five, oh, share verbal and our space mindfully. Consider a balance of taking and making space, move up, move back. Tools to do this include uh, the acronym uh, WAIT, why am I taking and vocalizing support for another person's comment without repeating the same points that have already been made? Thank you. We all feel good about that set of agreements still. I think anybody wants to. Yeah, see some thumbs up. OK, great. Thank you. Um, next thing, hopefully folks have had some time to review. Um, but I was curious if we could maybe attempt to officially approve the minutes from our last two meetings before we get even more backed up on that. Um, and Carla, if you don't mind dropping those in the chat, that'd be helpful. Um, does anybody have any concerns at this point um, with us going ahead and approving the minutes from either our July 18th joint meeting or our September 25th joint meeting? All right, so hearing no concerns, if you can just just give me some sort of positive affirmation, thumbs up uh, or wave your hand or in the chat that you feel good about uh, approving the draft minutes for July 18th. Great. Great. And if we can do the same for the September 25th minutes. I see a hand, Jennifer. Uh, was that a thumb? Was that a positive hand or a comment? I just want to make sure I'm not missing. Sorry. Sorry, I meant to be so off. off Awesome. OK, I realize that I did not give clear direction, so great. Jump in if somebody has a comment, but I think we're good. Um, OK, fantastic. Then let's go ahead and. Return to our. Um, can you all still see my PowerPoints? OK, yes. And Nuvik, yes. do you have your I hand think. up for your for a comment or voting? So I apologize. You're supposed no, to be. No uh, worries. Yes, found out. <laughs> gotcha. All right. All right. So, um, Carla just dropped today's agenda in the meeting. Um, I would love for us to just take a minute, look at what the goals are. I just want to acknowledge that, um, timing-wise, you know, I basically if we find that, um, oh, here we go. Now I can see it again. Um, so we're going to kick off with a conversation about legislative priorities for this coming session, what our asks are to the legislature to try and support our implementation efforts. Um, I had 40 minutes slated. I'm going to be kind of presenting on some things we're thinking and get some feedback, then have an opportunity for public comments and then and take a break. Um, and then after that, I want to give a little update just on where we are with some of the different deliverables um, and go from there into a conversation about more in-depth planning on how we want meaningful participation of the public and EJ kind of focused populations or directly impacted communities um, to look in practice as we move forward with implementation. Um, 
kind of based on feedback from our survey that we did. And the reality is that as you'll, the punchline on my update on major deliverables is most of them need to really have a community engagement plan built in. So I think we just need to take a minute with that. So those were kind of the main goals for the meeting. Um, I will keep the public comment times at 2 and 3.40 as planned. And I think if we need to take more time for the legislative priorities, we'll just bump the things after the break until we feel complete with that first agenda topic. Um, any concerns with this approach uh, or goal at least for today? OK, um, and then again, just any sort of positive thumbs up. Um, or wave or whatever affirmation that we're good to consent to the agenda and move forward. Okay, yes, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Alrighty, um, is that everything in that? Yes, okay. All right, great, we're only nine minutes behind. That's not so bad. Um, all right, then I'm gonna go ahead and take us into our first agenda topic. Um, I want to acknowledge, I'm going to acknowledge up front that my slides are a little painfully dense. Um, so I did go ahead and create a PDF version of the PowerPoint that might be easier for you to like open and zoom. Like there's definitely gonna, might, might be some moments where small text is a challenge, but the PDF version, the text is very large. So if you find you're having a hard time seeing the actual little box in Teams, you're welcome to reference that PDF um, for some content. Uh, um, yeah, and that should be available in the agenda. There we go. OK, so. I'm going to as I go into this presentation, there's. Um, you know, I'm going to be laying out some information. I'd really love it if folks feel empowered to just like raise your hand or jump in with questions during while I'm talking, especially if they're clarifying questions. Um, and then I also have structured time to pause and very intentionally get feedback at different stages as well. But please don't be shy as I go through this to stop me mid sentence and say, hey, I would love to clear this up or I have a question related to this. Um, it's, it's absolutely welcome. And Emma's generously offered to help me keep track of that while I'm um, looking at the PowerPoint. So. All right, so. Carla and I have been working and trying to get input from all of you and talking with leadership at the Agency of Natural Resources about what do we really need to come to the legislature with um, to support the work that we're trying to undertake um, and continue to undertake for for years. Um, you know, and so these proposals that we're going to walk through are really meant to help us sort of lay the groundwork with what we need to do this this work well. Um, and so, I, you know, this is something we've talked about, but the first priority that we're really honing in on uh, is compensating the people who are doing the work um, as sort of a first starting point that we really need to grapple with. Um, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of directly impacted community members through multiple different forums have raised this issue. Um, there's a long history of racial inequity being named as a fundamental issue with our per diem payments, especially as we seek to have more diverse boards that involve more low income and more folks of color on these boards. Um, and so this is a quote from a letter that was sent by the Vermont Renews BIPOC Council back in 2022, specifically asking that the legislature really consider um, adequately compensating the advisory board for uh, for the advisory council for what we're working on together here. Um, and so we kind of have two different areas that we're looking at in this. One is specifically around advisory, the advisory council, you all, and looking at your per diem rate. Um, and what we're proposing, and this is based on feedback from legislative efforts in the past, um, based on the fact that there are more and more advisory boards and councils even just within the Agency of Natural Resources that we're managing that are struggling with this. Um, our secretary is really strongly supportive of us going for a statewide kind of resolution to the per diem issue. And so our goal is to, with you all, you know, make sure we agree on sort of an adequate per diem rate that we want to advocate for um, being sort of a statewide floor for advisory councils. Um, so that's kind of the first proposal that we're talking about. Um, and then the second proposal, and this is 
a little bit more vague right now, but I think it's something that we can get kind of, I want us to just sort of keep working at. It may not be a one time, one solution, but how do we just keep looking at all the different legal barriers that agencies keep running up on around being able to actually compensate for community engagement itself? So that's kind of another aspect to this that we're trying to think about. Um, but most of what we're going to hone in on today, I think, is, is proposal one and our approach to moving that forward. Um, I did just pull out quotes from our own draft core engagement principles that we put together. Um, you know, I've been sitting with the draft principles and, you know, it's it's challenging to think about how do we move ahead with, you know, promoting agencies to implement these principles and we need to deal with it ourselves. Um, so just acknowledging that you know, that's just something we've already identified as a priority through the drafting of those principles. Um, this is not the first time that there's been a specific request made uh, of the legislature for the Environmental Justice Advisory Council specifically. Um, I just want folks to know the history here and thanks to Jennifer Byrne for connecting some of these dots for me. Um, you know, there was an original request made to the legislature in 2022 for a $200 a day per diem. It translates to $25 an hour, um, about 17,600 total budget expense to support that. So this was a request made and submitted specifically by the Conservation Law Fund, um, by Rejoice, by Rights and Democracy, and by the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. So folks can click on the link in that PowerPoint to see the full sort of budget request. Um, I know it's a little tiny, but I pulled out this table just to show some examples um, that they put in their request of other boards that currently already receive higher per diem rates than $50. So I just want to acknowledge that there is a history in Vermont of there being exceptions made for certain boards to have per diem rates, that there are pathways for us to ask for our board to receive a particular rate. That is a potential pathway. Choosing to go for a statewide advocacy approach brings up different challenges and different opportunities. Um, but I do know from just speaking to folks who did some of this advocacy last year, that a lot of the pushback that seems to be growing is a desire on the part of the legislature for a sort of statewide resolution rather than a continuous sort of board by board by board approach to this issue. Um, so just acknowledging that. I just wanna pause. I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to give any context to this you know, earlier ask that feels important before I move on and are uh, no, no pressure, if not. OK, I'll keep moving. Oh, yeah, Abby, go ahead. Phoebs, I don't have any contacts, but I was just curious in this proposal one option, would what's the dollar amount of the statewide resolution per diem that would be proposed? Yeah, so sorry. Um, so we've been talking about. We want to come up with a number that is based in like real rationale that we all sort of feel good about collectively. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't say that we've set the number. I think in my mind, two hundred and fifty dollars has been sort of a goal that um, reflects what the current highest rate is, what I've heard other boards are interested in going for. That translates to about $31 an hour in terms of an hourly rate. Um, yeah, so that, so 250 is the number we've been sort of holding as, as the possibility, but we're open, we're open to feedback at this point. Um, yeah, I see another hand. Um, yeah, that's me. Just the context piece. Um, and what I just put in the chat is a spreadsheet um, that kind of goes along with that letter that Carla just shared. Um, hopefully y'all can see it. And um, what that is, there's tabs at the bottom, like FY23, FY24. So that was, you know, just our proposed basically budget for the advisory council. It's not just stipends, but also, um, you know, facilitation, professional development, um, community engagement funds, stuff like that. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, OK, so any other questions on that front? OK. 
So I just wanted to, um, since you, I did ask you all for some feedback on this in our survey. So I just wanted to share some of the feedback that came out of that survey. Okay. Um, you know, and rather than starting cold in this meeting with input from the group, um, you know, we had about half of the, you know, this represents feedback from just half of our group. So take it with a grain of salt um, in that regard. But of those folks that we did hear back from, um, and we asked specifically, in the survey, whether or not there was support for uh, increase to 250, um, that yes, there is support um, amongst that. And then uh, seven folks said that kind of outright. There were four folks who had some additional comments about how we might think about it. Um, and yeah, so I just have those here for folks who are interested. In particular, somebody had made note that the Land Access and Opportunity Board and their Sunrise report, which I linked here, um, proposed a different sort of approach to how, you know, an advisory board might get supported. Um, so that's, you know, they were looking at an hourly rate that has a monthly cap on hours worked. So I just, you know, somebody had brought that up. I wanted to share that with other folks. Um, and yeah, we also, uh, let's see. <clears throat> And then I know there was a question in one of the comments also about just what is just clarifying what it means to go for a statewide approach and um, thinking about uh, just what the difference is in terms of a budget implication for that and, and what kind of support we'd have. So yeah, it is certainly a different magnitude of ask to approach a statewide solution. And I think this is just sort of a strategic consideration for all of us to consider um, moving forward. Um, you know, our approach and what we're thinking about and hoping to do is, you know, have some sort of letter of support. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we would need to agree on a minimum rate that we're asking for support from. Um, you know, and the arguments, I don't think I need to make them to all of you so much. Uh, we've heard them over and over again about the fact that we're talking about asking members from directly impacted communities with incredible levels of expertise to come to the table and do this work with us. Um, you know, I think it's important for us to not just talk about how much it would cost to make these per diem increases, but to actually look more big picture at how much the state spends on expert consultants generally and kind of do some comparative analysis there, um, because that's really what we're talking about in a lot of ways. Um, and I just, you know, want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, there's a lot that is asked of this advisory board. Um, you know, just one small example uh, is that you know, there's an expectation that every year advisory board members will provide written recommendations to all the covered agencies um, on how they should be responding to civil rights and environmental justice complaints that they receive. This is an annual requirement, right? So these are like really um, kind of weedy work requirements um, that, you know, deserve to be compensated. So, you know, we're trying to think right now about how can we just build sort of support with advocacy, um, with other advisory boards and the agencies that administer those boards um, and you know, build legislative support and reach out to some of our advocates. So, um, Nuvik, I see your hand. Oh, oh thank you. This is just a follow-up question. Uh, I apologize for, uh, for this uh, because I may uh, probably miss it. So, uh, on uh, uh, the per diem, it's like uh, you wanted all of us to to approve or disapprove of uh, increase, am I right? Because I, I don't recall actually uh, uh, filling out a uh, uh, form like this where, you know, I was supposed to get information. So I'm trying to make sure I do that if uh, this is a requirement for me. Yeah, no requirement. I mean, you know, we were just looking for general feedback in the follow up survey from the last meeting, but it's also okay. totally OK if you didn't have a chance to get to that. There will be other opportunities and, you know, for us, us to all coordinate and, you know, that'll be a big part of our follow up is just kind of coordinating this approach with all of you. So my goal today is just to make sure that we're we're all feeling like this is the best way to support you all. <laughs> um, and then from there, we can, you know, continue to write draft this letter, get signatories, um, you know, and work with other other groups that are trying to achieve the same thing this year. Uh, thank you for making it clear. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so 
that's that's that section. Hopefully straightforward enough. Um, I'm you know curious at this point, you know, if there's any particular strong feelings that folks have or want to share about sticking to a rate of a particular rate, um, you know, 250, the original 200, um, and or any thoughts about how we'd want to go about advocating for this. Um, so yeah, just want to take a minute, open the floor before we move to the next the next topic. I mean, I would say uh, uh, to me, it's uh, it, it's it's pretty normal to, you know, to increase that to 250. Uh, I'll just say that the uh, Vermont Public Utility Commission supports uh, advocating for a $250 per diem, and uh, that's what we're uh, advocating for in our budget this coming year, and uh, we're, help, uh, we're, we're happy to support uh, the advocacy effort. Elizabeth. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so next steps on this, you'll be seeing this draft letter come together. Um, oh yeah, Abby, go ahead. I'm sorry, I guess I'm just slow on raising my hand. I, I wondered if there was thoughts around a strategy that if I'm supportive and I and I believe that my agency would be supportive, though I haven't officially asked that question, I guess, um, of the, the increased per diem rate as a statewide per diem rate. I wonder if if there's a moment in time if we get the sense that there's not general consensus for this statewide per diem increase, if there can be a a change in strategy so that at a minimum, the EJ Advisory Council's per diem could be increased in FY25. Or if there's even openness to that, or if from an equity standpoint that there's not support for that approach. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Sort of like, all right, this is choice one, but if we're feeling like the legislature is not going to bite on a whole statewide, you know, change, do we, are we willing to then go to advocating for just this council and right. um, kind of a one-off solution? Yeah. Um, Carla, I don't know if you want to add any context to that in terms of just conversations with a &R and thoughts around that. Yes, um, so I had a discussion with uh, leadership about this topic and um, with many other stakeholders. Um, and I think there is agreement that um, this, this issue really needs to be addressed statewide. Um, but to the extent that we believe that we that that was like a long shot. Um, I think it is the prerogative of this group to decide as a collective whether the best thing to do is to pursue a one-off solution for this advisory board. Um, of course, you know that's not a guarantee that we would be getting it. Um, but I think that's that's something that's open for conversation. Um, the agency really, you know, supports tr uh, solving this once and for all, um, sort of like that statewide approach. Um, there are other advisory councils that sit with within the agency of natural resources. So in terms of um, you know picking and choosing, it puts it puts our agency in a you know, in a in a weird conundrum, um, but I think you know to the extent that these two bodies, you know, the interagency committee and the advisory council, there is consensus that the best path fo path forward um, would be to advocate for our camp council um, in exclusion of others. Um, then you know, I think that that's that's up for the, this group to decide. Um, that's really all I have to say.
Thanks, Carla. Um, I would really appreciate hearing from advisory council members specifically. Um, you know, maybe we can go through who's here real quick if you're willing to just kind of chime in about where, you know, your thoughts on, on which approach of the approaches we're talking about, you know, feels important. Um, the statewide approach, if it feels like, yes, we need to have another backup plan to just advocate for us if the statewide isn't going to take. I think that's kind of a question outstanding. And I think there's also a deeper question that's going to come up in the next part of the conversation of if this does not take, what does that mean for your involvement? What does that mean for how you think we need to like how how can we not? I think what I'm concerned about right, is that we're acknowledging that this inequity is undermining our ability to do the work. And, you know, if and so I just want us to proactively think about what the implications will be, you know, if we're not successful, so we can advocate, hopefully, to be successful. Um, but yeah, just thoughts for what this, you know, what that might mean for how we should approach the work down the road. Uh, yeah, I see Mariana and then, or Walter and then Mariana. Go ahead, Walter. Yeah, thank you. So three things very briefly. Um, you know, one, I, I, I put my comment in that I I really support the idea that this needs to be increased to 200 or 250 if that's possible. And I, I think that, you know, both and or, you know, like advocating for ourselves, but agreeing that it might be more successful if we try to do it statewide maybe not or maybe it'll take longer if it's a statewide approach so you know i'm i'm willing to trust um you all who are much more familiar with um the state government and the legislature on what might be more effective in doing that but i do think at the ultimate we at the bottom line we need to advocate for ourselves and if we can work with other groups as well Great, but you know, we have to be clear about that. And then I would just say, just for myself, I mean, my participation will continue. Um, it's it is somewhat tricky. Um, because like most people here, I have other jobs and duties which are actually statewide. Is you know, my role is I'm the chief of staff to the Bishop of Vermont, so I you know, I have a lot of balls that I have to keep in the air, and and the advisory committee is one. Um, you know, that may change soon, my role working, so I would have more time, uh, but I would find it even then um, certainly a greater motivation to the time that I'm, because I'm basically, uh, this is off hour work for me, so I have, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm in a meeting, this meeting, and I, um, I'm not doing something for the diocese, Episcopal Diocese of Vermont, you know, I'll have to make that up somewhere else, um, which usually means it doesn't come out of my family time or whatever. So it does come out of that. So um, I think for me, the the motivation to continue will, is intrinsic, but it is appreciated if, you know, the per diem was increased to reflect. I think the importance of the work. And the last thing I will say about that is, I think others I'm sure have commented in um, emails and the previous meetings. Um, it's ironic when you show the PowerPoint of other groups getting more that for advisory committee members um, who represent particular focus groups who are the more marginalized in our state that you know we're getting the lowest amount. And you know I think it speaks for itself about why I think advocating for ourselves is essential. Thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. Really appreciate hearing your perspectives. Um, Mariana, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I was trying to put down my hand. Um, I pretty much share what uh, Walter just said very clearly and eloquently. So I think that I'll put a, you know, a cross in, in all his sentences pretty much, um, like double up. That's what I mean, a cross meaning two times. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I wanted to reinforce that I trust those who are more familiar with government to to guide this decision making process. Um, and and I also want to reinforce the idea that um, it's very important to recognize that we may be leaving people behind if we don't if we don't if we're not able to who you know compensate them for their time as needed. For me personally, just like as Walter too, I will continue with the board. This is part of my job as a as what I do in Hunger Free Vermont. So um, it's not so much that I can speak from personally. So, but yeah, that's it. Just not to make it long. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, any advisory council? One quick question. Yeah, Sorry, please. Steve. As soon as I turn off the microphone, I remember how are the other boards? How did the other boards determine those amounts? And why <laughs> did we get the short end of a stick, if that's the right way to say it? Like, yeah, why do we why are we determined that it's 50 and other boards are 250? That's such a wide difference. I don't understand that. Steve, I can try to I don't have I yeah, thanks, Rachel. I can't um, provide logic to the reasoning except to say that I think the legislature just defaulted to the standard per diem. I don't recall, but Jennifer, you, you were also in the session, so maybe you can correct, but I don't recall that there was a um, like a weighing one board, the value of one to another. I think it was just a general constraint in available funds and a decision to default to standard. Um, was my sense. Yeah, in other words, to provide more clarity is the $50 is is the standard in the state of Vermont. Um, and so the other entities that are receiving more, um, they requested and underwent a legislative process to get those amounts approved. So they 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 followed up um, legislatively um, to increase their per diem. And so this is a question before us right now is um, which Abby um, presented is um, do we do we go the path of um, requesting a statewide um, a fix to the per diem um, rate and bring on board the many other boards um, you know, within the Agency of Natural Resources and many other um, and many others, or do we just um, then decide that this entity we're going to advocate for our advisory council um, to the exclusion of the other groups um, and then try to attempt to get the same um, or similar um, resolution for us? And attempt is an important word here because there's no guarantee that we would instead in, indeed um, get what we would be asking for. But I see Gail has her hand up. Hi, I was wondering, are there other entities receiving the standard rate as we are? Yeah, most boards are currently at the $50 a day rate. Um, the exceptions are fairly, fairly small in comparison because there's a good 20 or 30 boards easily across the state. So what would be the pros and cons of at least advocating for those entities that are receiving the minimal rate? Yeah, I think the way we've been thinking about it is, I mean, the pro is that then we're dealing with an equity issue across the state um, because it's an equity issue no matter what board we're talking about. And one of the things that I've, you know, been thinking about is just regardless of the topic of what a group of people is advising policy making on, we want it to be a group of people who represent low income Vermonters, BIPOC Vermonter, like diverse, we want diverse voices in the room for any policy issue, not just justice issues, not just equity issues. So I think, you know, one of the pros is that we're really making it accessible 
for lower income Vermonters to engage in this sort of really important, crucial aspect of policymaking equitably, um, asking people to make six to six fifty dollars, six dollars and fifty cents an hour to do the kind of work we're doing just simply is, is really not accessible to a lot of folks. And it's, there's a lot of folks who just on its face will not engage in that way. And I think the more the state is leaning into advisory boards as sort of an equity accountability tool or like an equity cons consultation tool, the more sort of, you know, concerning I think this disparity is is becoming and um, being raised. So the pro is that, you know, we're dealing with equity statewide, which is great. I think the con is that it costs more. So you're just dealing with a much larger legislative ask financially to try and resolve it statewide. Um, and so I would be working with budget analysts over the coming months to kind of look at those numbers. What are we talking about? The cost would be for this to be statewide. What would the cost be just for our advisory council? Um, and we can circle back and talk through some of those numbers, but it's, um, yeah, I don't know if that helps, Gail. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Rich, I did see your hand up. I don't know if you wanted to. I, I was just going to say I'm on one of those agencies, uh, one of those boards that gets the $50 per diem. Um, it, it's what it is. It's inadequate. Uh, it had in my understanding that everybody was in that boat. And so, you know, we weren't squeaking a whole lot about it. Um, but it's, it's, it is inequitable across the board. And, and um, and when it comes to this to this council, um, environmental justice, I think the the inequity is even more obvious. Um, it, it's painful to have to state the obvious. Uh, you're you're asking us to show up and do this work, and this is what you this is what we get for it. Um, it doesn't sound to me like it's serious. So I support it. Uh, unfortunately, it's the rule, not the exception. Um, and that's where we are, uh, looking for justice. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Rich. Um, I want to pause. I knew that I totally messed up these agenda times, so just apologies already. Um, we're at two o'clock, which is when we had scheduled public comment. So I would just like, we'll just, we'll pick back up, um, where we left off in terms of the queue, but I really want to honor if anyone from the public has a comment they wanted to make relevant to this or totally separate, um, that's totally okay. And just open up the floor to that um, for a minute. And we will have one more public comment period at 340. So I'll just flag that as well. Looks like a net. Uh wants to make a comment. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Annette. And if you could introduce yourself just to the group, that'd be really helpful. Yes, um, this is Annette Smith. I'm with Vermonters for a Clean Environment. And um, I think my comment is probably going to be more relevant in the later comment period, but I may have to be attending a meeting between three and four. I don't know yet. Um, Vermonters for a Clean Environment works with uh, Vermonters in our communities dealing with regulatory processes, including uh, Agency of Natural Resources permits and um, the Public Utility Commission regulatory process, uh, Act 250. We've been doing this work for 24 years, and so our interest in this process has to do with the implementation and as I look at the um, the core principles and trying to figure out how to connect up the work that we do on the ground, helping raise the voices of Vermonters so they have a say in what goes on in their communities, I'm I'm a bit challenged to uh, understand how it will be implemented. I have some ideas and. Uh, John Brabant, who works with me, who also worked at the Agency of Natural Resources for 25 years, is also in this meeting. So um, he will bring some very important insights. I, I, I think my initial comment has to do with the focus populations and how um, I try to take the environmental justice issues that I see through that lens. And 
we see environmental justice that occurs at all income levels to a people of all income levels, not just low income. I, I will honestly say that in our work in many communities all over Vermont for more than two decades, we have not worked with very many people of color. Um, and uh, the third category about people who do not speak English is also uh, not something that we encounter. I mean, we've encountered uh, people who are Hispanic who speak English well, but the the developments that we deal with are often the type of developments that are inappropriate. They're often too large scale. We've worked on large farms, landfills, quarries. The organization got started dealing with a huge billion dollar natural gas power plant and pipeline project that was proposed for southwestern uh, Vermont in uh, 1999. And um, the injustices occur regardless of the income levels or what color people are or what language they speak. And and I did weigh in a bit in the Just Transitions Committee of the Climate Council because I've been concerned about how environmental justice is defined and the definition in the documents you've put together say all people or all, I forget the the, the word, maybe all Vermonters, but and that's what we see. And so it's how to address this injustice when corporations come in with plans that are way out of scale, but they have billions of dollars. This is something we've been dealing with for years, where citizens are up against a very short time period to put together very expensive lawyer and expert testimony. Uh, it's a massive injustice. It doesn't matter if there's a someone who has money. Why should the people who live in a community dealing with a really inappropriate development have to uh, empty their pockets. And often it's a lot of money um, for the developers uh, to, to counter the developers. And so there are some ways to deal with this. There has been talk for years about creating some sort of an office of public advocate that's independent. Um, other states have it. It's often called a consumer advocate. Another thing that does exist in some of the state agencies is the ability to build back to the applicant so that the agencies can hire their own experts or, for instance, a, a consumer advocate could hire experts. And I, I realize I'm getting ahead of where you all are right now in your discussions, but I did want to sort of let you know how I'm looking at how is this going to work on the ground um, and how are the state agencies going to actually do what's being called for in these principles about how to engage in our communities because coming in and holding a meeting and saying okay is everybody you know we're hearing from people and especially the focus groups your your focus population is not going to affect very many of the people who are affected by the types of adult developments that we have been experiencing so i want to thank you very much for the opportunity to uh comment on this and I, I will hope to weigh in more as this progresses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annette. I really appreciate you sharing your experience, sharing what you're seeing on the ground for other people's experience and just raising really critical strategic questions that we need to grapple with in thinking about implementation. You know, we, we did just meet and talk about the EJ focus population definition at our last meeting. And there's a lot more to discuss around that, you know, and I think everyone's intention is that we are using a definition that really helps us actually see where injustices are happening in Vermont and can be more accountable to that happening. So um, yeah, your comments are really appreciated. Um, I would love just as coordinator to have a follow up conversation with you and your team at some point, if that's something you're open to. And I have your email from earlier, so I can just follow up with you that way if that feels OK glad to you. To talk further, Phoebe. I'd, I'd welcome that. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, Awesome. Thanks, Carla. Yeah. All right. And yeah, anybody else from the public? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just basically wrote what you just um, verbally expressed, Phoebs. And I also included a QR code. Um, Annette, if if you know you have um, some engagement with folks who are interested in participating and providing comments and feedback um, to us regarding the implementation of this law, um, that's that's a good way to do that so that we can capture and then continue the conversation, um, not only in these forums, but after these meetings are over. Um, because as you identified, this is an ongoing um, process and it's going to be, you know, iterative. So getting information from community members is most important. Thank you. Does anybody else from the advisory council or interagency committee want to say anything about the comments we just heard? I know if not now that we will in the future, not to say that that means. Yeah. Um, OK, anybody else from the public who had a comment to make? All right. Well, thank you, Annette. Again, appreciate you being present and for taking time to be in this meeting and share your experience with us. It really means a lot. Um, so, yeah, I just want to um, just kind of bring us back then into the agenda. I think um, we were just I think there were a few sort of outstanding hands of comments that wanted to be made just around the per diem so maybe we could just get a quick list of anybody who wants to say any last comments on that and then we can transition into the next kind of major legislative priority uh area which is around the the deadline extensions so uh yeah jennifer go ahead yeah i guess i have so, uh questions relating to process um and like what I, I, you know, if, since this is sort of our first foray into asking the legislature to act, um, it does feel like the EJ Advisory Council's job to do that. I'm not sure how the interagency committee feels in terms of like I'm I'm very confused about how much agencies get involved in lawmaking and advocacy, which um, so I'd love to have an explanation of the line there, um, but I would definitely be in favor of us maybe writing a letter, but definitely supporting the statewide change. I think if it came out of the EJ Advisory Council as a letter that other groups could sign on to, um, that could be really effective, and I'm sure we would get a lot of signatures from other boards. Uh, there might already be a letter um, or people who were advocating for this last year. So either way, definitely in support of raising the stipends to 250. Great, thanks Jennifer. So yeah, hearing support for 250, hearing, you know, sort of a suggestion around the EJ Advisory Council being sort of a letter drafter and getting support from there and then a question about sort of what role are agencies playing formally or otherwise in this advocacy process and i know our agency was talking about specifically having you know a letter of support from our secretary for this change um you know i think that's something that other interagency committee members could think about so you know is that its own letter as you know are they parallel letters is it actually just a signatory to the EJ Advisory Council letter? I don't know, Carla, if you have any other thoughts on that you want to chime in on. Well, yes, um, I I very much appreciate um, the approach that you suggested, Jennifer. Um, I think perhaps, Phoebs, what we can do is follow up um, with a presentation of the alternatives and get um, feedback on on you know the alternatives and what's a preferred method once folks have had opportunities to go back to their agencies and get some feedback um, around this specifics and also advisory council members have had an opportunity to um, think about the conversation that um, we just had 
regarding um, whether to do a collective state of Vermont um, appeal versus um, a unique and distinct appeal um, for this particular board. Um, but it's something in, in your recommendation, Jennifer, really captures some, something I've been thinking about, which is um, if, if there is a letter that captures the other boards that are subjected to the standard per diem rate um, of the state of Vermont, uh, then that that to me is a way to communicate the impetus and um, the need across the board. And so it would leave less arguments, I think, um, to the legislature. Um, because all of the boards would be included. I think that may present a stronger um, a stronger argument for implementing the change that we'll look for. Um, you know, it's this this notion of um, there's power in the numbers. Um, and I think your comment really captures something that I've been um, considering but had not articulated yet. Um, but I think, Phoebs, in terms of next steps, perhaps following up with um, some feed feedback gathering tool to narrow down and identify a path forward so that we can start moving um, forward, which with whichever path is decided would be best. Because I want to make sure that we're also um, capturing the voices of those who are not here right now. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, this is really helpful. Just kind of get a sense of the different considerations and nuances. So yeah, we can follow up with kind of like a much more explicit step by step sort of plan and get some final feedback and, um, you know, and actually start getting a letter draft to get some feedback on too. So that'll be a big next step coming out of this meeting. Okay. Um, great. Well, we are scheduled to take a break at this point. Um, so I think we should go ahead and do that. We've been together for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and when we come back together, we'll uh, pick up on priority two, which is taking the time to do things right and how we want to recalibrate our due dates. So, um, yeah, so let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break like we'd planned and regroup at 225. Thanks, everyone.
All right, I think we're coming up on our 10 minutes, 2.25. Um, folks want to trickle back, give some indication of presence. Um, just want to acknowledge there was a little bit of ongoing questions and discussion about per diems in the chat while we were on break, which is great. I uh, just want everyone to be aware so you can read it up. Um, just Dale asking some thoughtful questions about how have these other agencies um, that did get higher rates successfully uh, advocate for that. And um, Jenny provided some information just sort of, you know, functionally where that would show up in terms of annual budget uh, justifications. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's both things just kind of knowing the mechanics of where and how we would make that sort of request and advocate for it. But I also think it's worth just potentially chatting with folks who are part of that advocacy and, and learning what what was involved in getting that approved. So I think both things can happen. OK, but with that, um, I'm going to shift us over to priority two. Um, and since arguably this this topic might take even a little bit more sort of thinking through together to to come to an agreement. And at the end of the day, what we want, what I'm looking for is to honor the fact that we are like so consistently behind in due dates that they've become sort of meaningless, which doesn't let anybody really feel accountable or have sort of tools for that. And I, I just think that's a disservice for everyone. Um, and we're trying to be accountable to the fact that this is extremely important time sensitive work. Um, and we know it's complicated. So I'm just coming to all of you to really kind of lay out what we've been grappling with and thinking about and just hopefully get a little bit more direction on how we want to move forward as as a group to address this kind of current situation. Um, I went back and was watching some testimony uh, at Amy Redmond's suggestion um, around when the law was first passed and um, Kaya, who's not here today, had this quote that really struck me in talking about um, the work and and you know what why community engagement is so important. Um, but she said that which takes too much time to understand gets left behind, and I just felt like that was really potent. Um, that you know when things are you know as tricky to think through as, for example our legally bound definition of meaningful participation, you know, it's easy to sort of bypass the parts of, of doing the work that we just, we don't quite get, you know, versus taking the time it takes to really educate ourselves, to be present with, with paradigm shifting ideas, to put in the effort it takes to make that work happen in practice. Um, and I just think when, for me, when I look at the definition of meaningful participation that's in the Vermont environmental justice law, and I break it down into its parts, um, there's a lot in here that I think is going to take a minute to really understand and to put into practice. And um, during that testimony, one of the legislators asked Kaya, you know, well, can you give me an example of, you know, what don't we already know? What are we going to be learning from community engagement? What are we going to be learning from this work? And she specifically spoke to what's kind of in this second bullet here. You know, like, you know, we talk about we're now legally required by our law to be integrating diverse knowledge systems, including indigenous knowledge systems. Right? And she spoke to how that in particular is an area that as a state government, there's so much for us to learn about what that would mean in practice. Right. And I think for us as a group trying to put this into practice right now, we have a lot to learn. Um, but all of these parts are, are kind of tricky. Right. We're talking about all individuals, right? And to Annette's point, the, the law, the meaningful participation definition is not just for EJ focused populations, it's for all individuals to have an opportunity to participate in decision making around energy and climate change and environmental decision making, integrates diverse knowledge systems, um, requires that, that communities are enabled and administratively assisted to participate in community engagement through education and training. Um, and actually, you know, I think that speaks, Jennifer said early in that full budget request that was submitted for the advisory council, there was an ask for funds to provide training and technical assistance support to the advisory council to help you all do your work as, you know, a sort of a, an entity by which we are doing meaningful participation in theory. Um, so, you know, that's something that takes, again, time to put in place. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, for me, this, it, it's really, 
our due dates are sort of a legally bound, a legally binding thing that puts us into a degree of conflict with this other legally binding definition that our law has put in front of us that we are meant to to be implementing. Um, so taking the time to do things right, what we're thinking about doing um, specifically is an across the board statutory two year extension of the due dates. Um, so it would actually be proposed as a technical correction, um, you know, based on just a lack of acknowledgement of all the startup time involved in doing this work and what that would take. Extended out to two years, so the sequence would be at least statutorily sort of the same thing that we've been working with, but just pushed out. Um, and the other proposal going with that is also a request to remove meeting caps, which gives us flexibility in how we use our time. Um, two years, you know, sounds like a lot and it is a lot, um, but I just want to kind of point out quickly sort of what we're thinking about this additional time is really going to allow for. Um, in particular, you know, sort of the same language from our core engagement principles, time to sort of lay the groundwork for doing the work at all, um, addressing compensation barriers. So, you know, I I need to spend time right now as your EJ coordinator coordinating advocacy for our per diem increase, which is time that is not going to be spent working on our other deliverables. So I just that needs to be acknowledged, right, that what the work we now need to do as a group all of us to advocate for equity for advisory council is time that's involved in making this work well, right? That we need to just be real about with ourselves. Um, we need to, again, you know, create sort of systems that we all feel good about that are sustainable for meaningful participation to be happening as all these different law deliverables are sort of coming up one at a time and we're sort of moving through them. Um, and there's still just ongoing outreach, education, trust building with stakeholders, like still meeting people all the time who are doing this work in the state, who are just connecting up to these groups, who are just learning about our meetings. It just, it takes some time to sort of build that network so we can get to a place where folks have the opportunity to engage with us. So that's just like on the front end to be prepared to do the work well. Then once we're actually into the doing the work well, you know, are we as a, as a group, actually ensuring there's room to have in input from directly impacted communities at every stage of the policies that we're trying to develop and change. Um, we're also, this law puts a ton of onus at the end of the day on covered state agencies to change the way they do business to improve justice outcomes. And so if we're not talking about what it takes to build capacity and culture change within those agencies, it's, no matter how much we understand what we're trying to do and the work that needs to happen, it's not going to go very far if we're not also working with the staff within these agencies for them to understand the onus, the impetus, the importance and how to do it well. Um, and just in general, the time it takes to research best practices, you know, to, to set ourselves up from the beginning to make wise choices about how we think about things like defining the environmental justice focused population, thinking through the nuances of that so that we set ourselves up for long term success. Um, and the other piece that, you know, and Carla's made this point a few times and she can speak to what she's learned from the EPA that kind of makes this really relevant is that, you know, we have a sequence of events of, you know, first we do this and then this and then that. But the reality is that all of these different parts of the law defining environmental justice focused population, mapping out that population and cumulative environmental burdens, um, thinking about how we're going to account for benefit spending. They talk to each other. These deliverables all sort of relate. And so having this two year sort of shift gives us a little bit more flexibility to kind of potentially move around the order of things where that just seems practical and reasonable to do the work well. Um, and it just gives us the chance to be adaptable and live with the reality that we have complex lives and that we're trying to do consensus based work. And so even today, we don't have all the voices of our advisory council at the table. So it takes more time to then follow up with those folks, ask them the questions I asked you all here today, make sure their voices get heard and not just say you didn't make the meeting. Oh, well, I, that's just not the approach we're trying to take here. Um, so those are some of the big points, I think, for Carla and I that are really driving this proposal. And Carla, if you want to say a word about that, um, please do. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, so I thank you very much, Peeps. Um, I think you've identified very accurately, you know, the conversations that we've had, not only amongst ourselves, but with others involved in um at the agency who have been working very diligently and um very hard to help us um do the things that we need to do um by law. So um, thank you very much for putting this together. So you mentioned gathering the feedback and making sure that we hear the voices. And part of that really necessitates, um, you know, which Annette mentioned in, in their comment, um, structures to capture that input, that feedback, and then respond to it, whether it's um, via meaningful incorporation of that particular feedback that was provided into the processes. And so those structures, um, up to this point, we've been trying to create those structures within the Agency of Natural Resources while implementing the law, while providing and putting together technical assistance to um, to allow this group to engage with each other. Um, and also provide guidance for the agencies that are covered within this law. Um, so there are many components to um, something that may seem um, kind of easy to gather, which is feedback. You know, you ask, you create a survey, and, and then you hear it. Um, but then, you know, we need to, we are committed, all of us are he here, are committed to taking that feedback and doing something meaningful with it. Um, and that I think is um, what the EJ law really speaks to. And so, you know, internally, as we are doing this work and putting together the structures and thinking about what implementing this within the other agencies would take, I think it becomes um, evident to us that more time to have conversations with agencies and and provide the support needed so that all of us are prepared to incorporate the deliverables that we're going to come out of this is of the utmost importance. Otherwise, I think we would be um, falling short on the purpose of this law. Um, and I just really wanted to share that um, with everyone here. Um, it, it It's felt up to this point that we are, you know, trying always to catch up, catch up. Um, and it's been, you know, needless to say, very stressful on our team. Um, and we do it with great pleasure. And it's part of our mission and the way that we see government work. Um, but, you know, allowing for... Um, sometimes so that we can actually do this work in a more measured um, way and we can right size it too to the capacity that we have. Um, I think it it's, you know, part of what was intended with with the passing of this law. Jennifer. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I guess I'm maybe over eager. Is this like, can we, are we in discussion? I just, what I wanted to do real quick is first acknowledge that you already sent comments before we get into discussion. So I can like acknowledge that this is not an agreed upon consented to thing yet. Um, and then yes, we can get into some comments. Just, you know, we did ask in the survey what folks think about it. Um, you know, th there were five folks who were like, yes, I support the two-year extension, great. There were six folks who had comments and sort of maybe not of not necessarily support yet. Um, so, you know, just the first again, a first comment of concern that moving out the dates two years is that agencies will simply delay work. And so a suggestion that we look at each date specifically and individually as a group and sort of think that through. I'm going to kind of circle back to how we're thinking about how to do both things. Um, there was also, you know, again, I don't want to extend the deadline for so long because, oops, apologies. Um, where did it go? Uh, ah, yeah. So a couple of folks who were a little worried about that being too long, maybe thinking a year makes more sense. But the other thing a number of folks raised is just, you know, can we have some interim due dates maybe to help keep the work on track? And so I just want to raise that what we've been thinking about 
internally around this is that, um, you know, the statutory extension would just sort of give us like statutory breathing room and and does not prevent us as the interagency committee and advisory council from setting interim due dates before those like last resort due dates that we think would actually keep the work flowing on a timeline that makes sense and that we can all be accountable to, but that can also stay flexible without us once again running up on, oh, we need another statutory extension. So I think, you know, there's the potential, I just want to acknowledge that there's folks that in terms of concerns about that being too long for certain deliverables, that we are working on the assumption that we can set interim due dates that actually feel like the right sort of thing within that two year extension, if that makes sense to folks. Um, and so, yeah, so just so folks can see what we're talking about in practice or practically, right? This is sort of what that revised calendar would look like. Again, this is like the absolute last date these things must be done um, statutorily. And then we could spend time sort of backtracking ourselves to say, all right, the core principles are now not technically due until September of 2025, but we already drafted the thing. Let's get it done sooner and keep that part of the work moving. Um, so I'll just pause there then. And then, yeah, go ahead, Jennifer, if you want to jump in and anybody else as well. Yeah, th there's, I guess, two things that I would definitely not want to expand for two years pers personally. I mean, one is the core set of principles. You know, we're we're meeting that target in general, and we should keep moving forward with that. But but the real thing that concerns me is the baseline spending report being moved out to 2026, um, because that's supposed to be a look back over the past three years, and we want to capture the past three years, not the next three years, if you know what I mean. So if it's 2026, we're just looking back to 2020 or 2022, we would be missing 2020, which I think is a very critical year in 2021. Um, that was the intent of the statute, um, you know, capturing the COVID money. And I think it we should still move forward and try to get that spending report, that initial baseline spending report, um, the guidance done and, and having the agencies working on that. Um, I could see extending it like six months, but extending it to 2026, I yeah, I would not be in favor of that. Thanks, appreciate that. Yeah, so um, let's skip that for a second. So yeah, I think this is exactly sort of where we're at is, is thinking through, so are there some sort of interim deadlines that we want to set in a formally consent to as a group that sort of say, this is what we're trying to work with, work toward. Um, you know, and so, for example, hopefully this is legible. So on this chart I have at the top in bold, just sort of like if this, this is just what those two year extensions look like, right? So 2025, the core principles, 2027, the plans. I just would like, I just dropped in some potential suggestions of interim steps that we could take um, that would keep us more on track with the timeline that we're talking about. So what would it look like? Look like for us to actually finish the principle in full by September, including the time it would take to get public input. And then on top of that, you know, if September 1st is our goal in 2024 to sort of get those principles into the agency's hands, could we be doing work between now and then to also think about a supplemental toolkit to think about actually, um, laying out a series of trainings and opportunities for agency staff to engage with the content we're about to see that send them you know so again, that groundwork laying the, there might be an opportunity for giving ourselves a little bit more time but i agree i think waiting until september 2025 is just lost time um the plans could be due 2026 instead of 2027 right um so i think it's for me it's thinking through yeah what are sort of reasonable steps and what can we do that will make each of those steps way more impactful with the extra time that we are building in for ourselves, right? It's not about sitting around idly, but actually setting ourselves up for success. Um, and the benefit spending was the other example that I, uh, you know, just took a minute with um, to say, you know, okay, what if we can get the benefit guidance out, not November of 2025, but closer to 2020, but still in 2024. Um, 
you know, then be getting some data reporting by 2025 from the covered agencies. Um, you know, and we've talked about, and I'm going to get to this later, the benefit spent. So there's a task group that's been working on the benefit spending guidance, which I'll touch on later in the meeting. Um, but, you know, it, we're already sort of asking questions like, do we need to do this in a couple phases? Should we like, ask the agencies for initial data, look at that data, and then follow up with them? So I, I'm not asking this group to think through all that right now. What I'm really asking this group is, do we trust that with the two-year statutory extension that we can internally, under the advisement of our task group, under the advisement of some of the staff that are in the weeds on this stuff, set and consent to a set of interim due dates that we all feel like really holds that line of original intent of the law, accountability for outcomes, keeping the work moving forward. Um, and does that feel like that is acceptable um, within the within the simultaneous ask of the legislator to just give us this sort of two year flexibility? Um, and so, yeah, I see Jennifer's question. Do we have the power to do that to set interim dates that the agencies will abide to? Um, which I, is a question I've also been sort of raising. So I don't know, Rachel and or Carla, if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, um, and Rachel is here as well. Um, and we've chatted about this. So we, so the statutory deadlines are the ones that need to be approved by the legislature. And so what um, the proposal is, is to request a two year um, recalibration. And then internally, um, the way to think about it would be um, the creation of a work plan that will actually um, guide how and when our, our tasks are completed by. And so that work plan is internal to both groups and we would go through um, a process of developing that together. Um, so the answer is yes, um, but I see that Rachel came to the screen, so perhaps she wants to add um, something else to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, um, you know, I am here in the capacity of just providing, like answering questions, I think about kind of the, the legal consequences. Um, I would just say that it is certainly true that if there's a statutory deadline, we can certainly, this group can meet deadlines sooner, can reprioritize deadlines, um, you know, and, and develop a work plan. I think that would all be acceptable. Um, it is a little tricky to um, not meet existing statutory deadlines, like the current deadlines, um, I think we're in a pretty tenuous situation because um, so far we have failed to meet almost every single deadline that's been in the statute. And so, you know, that's not just that's not a reflection on any like failure or lack of, um, you know, effort among this group. It's just kind of the reality of the the situation. So I think from my perspective, it would be helpful uh, for there to be you know, a discussion and a potential change in the statutory deadlines just so we don't keep flying by them. Um, but certainly this body could come up with an interim approach, reprioritize um, even the, the way things are are organized. The I would consider the statutory deadlines kind of as the backstop, the last possible uh, moment. But that's, I, I don't really have a, um, like I don't have a position on anything. It's just Kind of trying to help understand um, the backstop that we're talking about. Yeah, and just I think I think the question I hand here is we can set interim deadlines, obviously as advisory council, as interagency committee, as ANR for our parts of the work. Can we compel the covered agencies to also honor interim steps that are set within a two-year statutory extension? I think that's the rub that Jennifer's trying to ask. Yeah, I mean, certainly we I don't think there is any mechanism within the law to compel an agency to do something before a deadline in the statute. Um, there would be a lot of other, you know, potential reputational consequences. I guess I'd be interested if other uh, interagency committee members have thoughts on that, if 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 it adds value to have the deadlines um, be more stringent for your work. but in terms of your priority setting or planning. Um, but yeah, we wouldn't, there's not really a mechanism to compel, to compel the action.
Yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, I was just thinking about you know, in proposing this to the legislature. A question that might arise would be, OK, we're going to extend deadlines by two years, you know, but in that in the next two years between like 2023 and 2025, how do we know that you're going to keep making progress on things? And so if if we as the you know committees came up with a couple of those like interim steps that we're going to be taking um, to propose that to the legislature to show, um, you know, we're it's not like we're pausing the work, we're just continuing the work. Um, that might be a way to um, make a two-year extension more acceptable to the legislature. I'm sure we could think collectively. It looks like you've already given some thought to some of that stuff, and I know that we've started at the commission thinking about um, you know, some of the interim steps we're going to need to be taking in the next year or so. Um, so yeah, just brainstorming about um, making this pre presentation to the legislature. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, go ahead, Claire. Um, well, I pretty much think I can say I support what Elizabeth just said. It's a very similar comment to what I was um, thinking. I just will second that internally we're already thinking about the steps we would need to take to really intentionally and meaningfully fulfill these requirements and are supportive of an extension of the deadlines, but not to put off the work, but just to have more time to do it well. Um, so I, again, was, yeah, agreeing with Peeps and again, Elizabeth, thinking about what we would put in place to hold ourselves accountable to that. I think it will be important in advocating and for an extension. Um, and then just one reflection on what Jennifer mentioned about the intent being to really include COVID spending in the budget or the benefit spending look back. I mean, my understanding, my long non-legal understanding is that there's no actual dates in the legislation. So potentially there's something we could do to ensure that that timeline is still incorporated in those reports if that is really a concern. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, we're going to touch on this. This is a key question that is being contemplated in the creation of the guidance for the environmental benefit spending reports. Like, what is the specific three year look back period? So that's definitely a thing that we can pick right up kind of that, you know, knowing that original intention that Jennifer was naming and I think addressing the guidance. Um, I saw uh, another hands. I think that was Mariana. And I just, I think, it, and also just in terms of questions and feedback for the, I think Rachel's question, the interagency committee members who are here is, do you feel like if the statutory deadlines extended two years, but we as, you know, you all as the interagency committee said, yes, and we've set an interim target date for the covered agency to do this at this date a little bit sooner do you think your covered agency would follow that guidance seem like does that set us up for success um that's just kind of one of the key questions we're grappling with just to put that back out there but go ahead mariana I'd love to hear what you're thinking yes uh, thank you uh, um first i want to apologize if i miss something that was discussed today or at the previous meeting and that offer a little bit more of a rationale for this proposal. Um, I was just wondering um, where or what is the, I don't even know what the word is, but the grounds for proposing two-year extension. Um, I do understand that we need to take the time to do the work right and that different type of knowledge require more time, but why is it that we we are talking about two years um, as opposed to one year or 18 months or six months? How did we come up with that specific amount of time to extend? It, it For me, and again, I, um, I'm not sure if I have enough um, knowledge and training to to, to even say this, but it seems like a long time to postpone something, especially because I also think that the more that we work together, the more that we will build that trust and that will pick up a little bit the pace of our work. 
um, as a group. Um, and then, yeah, it seems so far in the future to me. But then again, I may be missing something that was discussed or some other background information that I that I don't know. If anybody wants to chip in. Did skip, I did skip over this slide earlier, um, Perkins is just awful to look at, but um, that was me trying to articulate sort of like all these other things that need to be happening um, that sort of feed into, first off what I'll say is it's two years, but in theory we already lost, we already lost six months at the beginning of this year. So it's actually an additional year and a half beyond the correction of six months that we dealt with. Um, and so what we're talking about then in my perspective is another six months ahead of us to even have a chance of our advisory council being paid. And then trying to do this work in depth the way we want to and having a year from there to get all that sort of foundationally set up. And again, it doesn't take just a year of that year of foundation setting doesn't necessarily have to mean like none of the deliverables are moving forward at all. And that's where those interim sort of sort of steps are helpful to see sort of together. Um, but, you know, just examples of the work ahead of us, you know, in addition to the per diem advocacy, you know, right now I cannot pay members of the community with the dollars we have for community engagement out of the ANR budget directly. The only way our agency can currently pay members of the public to come to a forum and engage is through a contract with a community based organization that requires a competitive RFP. And all of that process can take six to eight months to get in place. So that's just one example of where this extra time, as painful as it is, and it is painful to see those extensions, I feel it, um, comes into play. Um, you know, what it would look like to plan these actual forums, um, what it would look like to get, like, you know, even though we're creating right now some great guides and orientation materials, we have not done our plain language translation of like, you know, one of our core populations in the law are people who speak languages other than English that we're trying to serve through this law. And we have yet to really translate anything that takes time. Um, so it's just all these little pieces that I really feel like, you know, we need to sort of get ahead of ourselves on and, and get set up. Is it's kind of where this two year came out. I think, you know, one year felt like it might work. We might be totally good with just a one year extension, but do we want to have to go back to the legislature again if we're finding that some of those deadlines aren't holding it versus just having done two years at the beginning where it kind of feels like everything is going to get done within that extension and we can make it happen faster. So that was sort of the mentality. But Carla, please jump in because I know you really sort of spearheaded this number getting set. Yes, and then the the other consideration too is strategy. Um, this is this would be a proposal. We don't know that the legislature would approve it, and then if 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 it's not well received, then we have the fallback of one year. Um, and so that's another that's another approach that I really considered um, when coming up with the number. And then um, you know just also thinking about how to implement create the structures that are needed um, for the agencies to actually be able to operationalize these components um, based on the experience that I've had at the agency um, you know building structures that were not there um, and making sure that staff are prepared to absorb the deliverables and um, feel comfortable with the tasks um you know this this we are creating here a body of work that our agencies will need to embed as part of their daily operations and that takes so much time so much training that we ourselves have to put together um because we just don't have the time to contract um in order to prepare folks for example for the community engagement so we're, we're already um thinking and about putting together training starting december that will address a component public participation outreach meetings um but it's going to be months before um i feel comfortable asking our staff 
to actually start working on some of this this these items and then the other the other aspect um, that seemed to be important um, for me was I participated in a meeting where Matt Tejada the regional I mean the national environmental justice director for EPA and they were talking about justice 40 and their experience in implementing um, justice 40 at the EPA um and so their their path was very much like how i felt um so they started with a definition of disadvantaged communities and then as they were trying to um articulate that and operationalize that um together with an assessment of spendings because justice 40 um requires that 40 percent of of expenditures are allocated to disadvantaged communities they realized that the order in which they were addressing um or tackling justice 40 was kind of backwards so then they um developed CGIST while doing the scoping for a definition of disadvantage and they had EJ screen so what they did is they decided to go back to EJ screen um identify the programs where they could actually um track spending and then utilize those program programs I believe there were like six programs initial six programs and then they developed sieges and then developed the definition and then um, were able to move forward with implementation of justice 40 in just a handful of programs so see, thinking through how these things are actually going to be going to be um, operationalized within each of the agencies is something that that takes time that you know when I look at what the law requires of us it's very difficult to see it happening within the actual timelines also taking into consideration that six months went by um, while the per diem issue was um, was fixed and then another item that is extremely important is um, the conversation that we had prior to this one which is um per diem um more works implies more hours not only from the interagency members but also from advisory council members and so a way in which you know we can recalibrate and right size the work and not ask more um to the inequity that exists currently is to be able to work with a more um adequate timeline so you know those those were some of the considerations um and then when thinking about community engagement language access ensuring that the agencies have the internal structures to provide language access when doing community engagement and those are all conversations that we should have um, because if the answer is in the negative, then there is a lot of foundational work that needs to take place before we can actually um, say that we are providing meaningful um, access and meaningful participation to members of the community when we don't have foundational things like language access set in place for all of the agencies. Thanks, Carla. Um, go ahead, Abby. Thanks. I wasn't sure where I was in the queue. Um, I I just want to make sure, and maybe Carla, you address this a little bit in in the the piece that you just shared. But I I want to make sure that if we were to ask for a two year extension and and implement these interim deadlines, that that doesn't give well, if that's what we believe is all we need to be able to achieve the the outline scope and timeline, that's great. If we th think that we may also need more EJ coordinating staff capacity, we want the ability to hire a consultant to do public engagement and we need a budget for that or something, and we want to change how we can offer compensation, um, to the piece that you mentioned, Phoebe's like I, I'm wondering if we want to be really careful that we're not saying the only 
challenge with the structure right now is time, but there are these other permissions and budget and capacity pieces that we are also curious about or 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 eventually re requesting or or even a combined I mean I will trust ANR's instinct on whether that can be a part of the request this year but I I just don't I've so often seen the legislature assume that because we got our timeline extension that then all of our needs for the for the work is solved and I just don't want to send that message that all we need is more time because I think we actually need a little bit more than just time. Thanks, Abby. I very much hear that. Um, and just <clears throat> had been, you know, thinking we had been talking internally just directly to your question about, you know, wanting to get in sort of a habit of having sort of ongoing base budget sort of funding requests to support the work, starting at least by the 2025 session ongoing that we do that or biannually starting in 2025 that we just make that a normal part of our practice of organizing that, coordinating that, putting our you know, all of our justifications together, you know, making really concerted asks. So, um, but I hear you that we don't want, even if we're not making those asks this year, but we are asking for extensions that we need make it clear that these things go hand in hand and that extensions without resources will not equal like agencies doing everything the way we want. So heard very much. Um, yeah, Rachel, go ahead. Hughes, I just wanted to highlight or um, kind of what you said, Abby, and also just for background, you know, and I think when we get to the like how to look at the legislative history part of the session if we're going to share any I, I kind of wrote a little overview for folks um it was really i think it, and there was also a written comment that you know there was also almost like a like a multi-million dollar ask for support for the bill under the existing deliverables um and that you know obviously wasn't met and so it was really interesting because the the deliverables and the timelines were set along with asks from each of the interagency committees about what would be needed um, to achieve that. And then the final um, appropriation was significantly smaller, you know, only 700,000 and not even all of that set aside for staff. So it it was interesting. I think and a, a written commenter had commented on that too, that the original proposal to match the bill um, and what was in the bill when the agencies were asked what it would take, included uh, full-time staff, um, you know, for and uh, support staff support with you know embedded in the agencies to do the work. And certainly, um, you know, we got staff at ANR, but that was only a piece of the puzzle. So just think that historical background may be helpful. And um, as I mentioned, I kind of put together a guide so folks can, if they want to dig into the legislative history, you know, can certainly do that on their own as well. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I had that later in the agenda to, to talk about, but um, let's just, I do wanna make sure we take a minute that you can walk folks through that before the end of the time. So I'll keep tabs on that because um, it is a great new resource. Um, yeah, so I think this raises a couple questions for me to sort of grapple with. One is, you know, are there base budget requests that other interagency committee members have for their agencies that we want to be trying you know do we want to look at anything in 2024 ask that is around resourcing the work um and try to put anything together so you know have that go hand in hand with the statutory extension or is it enough to say you know we need this to your extension a year you're going to be hearing from us what we need budgetarily to do the work you know and we'll continue from there and, and is that enough so that's sort of an outstanding question for me um and I didn't, from the survey results, it didn't seem like there was a lot right now. It didn't seem like there was a lot of clear asks on this piece of things from agencies yet or um, clarity on what those asks would even be necessarily. So I know it takes some time to put that together. And I'm hearing that work was done originally, so maybe it does exist. So, you know, I'm also always playing catch up on sort of connecting the history to where we're at now. So apologies for that. But um, yeah. Go ahead, Claire. Thanks, Phoebes. I This question doesn't need to be answered right now, um, unless folks want to answer it. But I guess 
from my perspective, it would be helpful to know like what show of accountability in term whether it's just like agreed upon interim deadlines or something else from the advisory council that would be meaningful because you know to coming from the interagency perspective to what Abby and others have spoken to like I think we certainly support an extension just to feel like we have the space to meaningly figure out how to resource the work in a way that will really change the way we serve Vermonters and the work that we do. But I also can, when I heard two years, my first timeline was like, one of the th challenges we will face is people thinking we are just like putting off the work. And so it's not at all surprising to me that that has been raised as, an, as a concern. And I also totally can understand where that concern comes from. Um, so I guess, you know, whether it's, you know, an, a follow-up survey or another meeting, it would just be really helpful to know like what show of good faith and accountability would be meaningful um, from the agencies to show that we really are not pausing the work, just using the time to do it better. Yeah, yeah that's spot on, Claire agreed. I think that's sort of my question is like, do, and especially back to you all as interagency committee members, like does a clear written consented to fully by the interagency committee and advisory Commit council set of interim due dates feel like enough to take back to your agency to have them operate in good faith? You know, I think that's sort of the rub um, that we're up against. Uh, that that feels like that's the, in some ways the ideal situation is we give ourselves the statutory flexibility and then we really just set as we go reasonable time frames and everybody in those works with that um but we the last thing we want to do is set up a situation where we've given an agency justification to kind of blow off the work for two years um and set ourselves up for that so yeah i i I hear you suggesting maybe some follow up, a follow up survey or something to sort of get a better sense of that maybe would be helpful. Um, but I that for me is sort of the outstanding like procedural question, you know, um, do we trust that approach? Um, because I am suggesting that we would specifically, <clears throat> I do suggest that we very that we do formally before the end of this year consent to what we think those interim due dates should be as sort of a group and for me to talk with folks who've been involved in different parts of these deliverables to lay out the kind of suggestions that we can then work and tweak and hopefully by our December 18th meeting consent to um, as sort of our good faith accountability set of dates that live within that two year extension that this, hopefully the legislator is sort of just checking off for us. Uh, um, yeah, and we don't have to necessarily answer that question today, but that is the question I definitely came into this meeting hoping to get some some insights on too. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that before we switch over. I have I have a few thoughts. I think in this space, I would really like to hear um, what the advisory council members um, feedback and advice. Um, and then also I'm going to speak for myself and sort of like the way I see my role within the Agency of Natural Resources is like I am um, the accountability officer <laughs> for the Agency of Natural Resources. And so um, the way in which I personally approach this work is with um, deep conviction that this work needs um, paradigm shifts, um, commitment and, and full understanding that um, that it's been too long without any meaningful um, change in the way that agencies conduct their work. Um, and also um, a, like a brutal, and, I, and I'm fully aware of it, appeal um, to members of our communities that um, the intention is noble um, behind the request for the two year uh, recalibration. Um, the intention is to actually do good by the process, do good by the purpose of this law and by the individuals who are going to be most impacted by the work that we do and the work that we don't do correctly. Um, so I just really wanted to share that and make that very clear that um, the, the way in which I make sense of this recalibration is really to ensure that 
we're doing this correctly and that we are actually working towards improving systems um, and structures that have been um, biased against certain individuals in our communities. Thanks, Carla. Okay. So, you know, I think we can <clears throat> sort of follow up like we, you know, usually do get sort of final feedback on this approach. It sort of feels like the pathways in front of us are one year statutory extension, just in terms of feeling like we get some breathing room, but we're not creating sort of the fear of like two years is too long delayed, or we stick with the two years, but we really are committed to setting these interim steps for ourselves and, you know, communicating clearly with covered agencies and providing support around that about that's the expectation within this. Um, and I think those are sort of the two pathways in front of us. So, yeah, um, you know, take that home, I think, to sort of more deeply consider. Yeah, go ahead, Claire. Sorry. Um, I just, it would also be helpful to talk about at some point a plan for what we would do while making this request, knowing that we have already missed some deadlines, but would have additional deadlines coming up. What the approach would be in that front. Yeah, 100%. Thank you for raising that. I've been asking the same thing because I know that the um, the agencies are expected to produce the civil rights and environmental justice complaint reports in January. So that is a great example of something that we need to give explicit direction on one way or the other as we're in this sort of statutory request limbo. Um, so yeah, I know that again, this is another thing that I've been trying to kind of think through with Carla. Um, you know, my my strong instinct myself is just that it, it's this that deliverable is a great example of one that waiting a year would give us a lot of time to help our advisory council get on better footing since they have to bear a pretty heavy load of the responses written responses to all of those reports so that's sort of where my instinct went of like oh it could help to give one more year to get to that point um and and Rachel's talked to me, you know, about the original intent with that deliverable is it's it's not meant to be a super heavy load. It's just what do you got and send it to us and let us know what your reporting systems look like. Um, so maybe it would help to know just right now a sort of baseline of like what's your reporting system and have you gotten anything and and we can really support the advisory council through that writing, you know, response process this year intensively. So it's not too much load on all of you, but, you know, I can sort of balance that workload. So those are the two sort of potential pathways there. And we have not made a final decision on that, but I agree we have to ASAP because it's it's coming right up. Um, so open to any thoughts on that or Carla, if you have more you want to say on that. Yeah, Nuvek. Yes, oh, thank you. So. Um... I truly echo the idea of, uh, you know, having uh, two years extension and at the same time, you know, having some uh, 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 deadline of within, the, within us. Uh, because as uh, somebody raised, I believe that was it, raised it. Uh, what I was scared about is to, uh, you know, fall in a place where, you know, we constantly uh, revising the date and constantly, uh, constantly reaching out to our uh, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to a policy makers and say we need this deadline for this specific deadline. Then a few probably months later on, we go back to them again. So these are the kind of situation I don't want. Uh, I, I don't want to see moving forward. But uh, uh, truly, uh, 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 to me, it's there's nothing wrong for us having deadline because it gives more more room to complete the work and. Uh, when we raise the fact that you know uh, 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 whether how can we uh, uh, make it understandable to uh, our different agencies like uh, this is uh, non the normal deadline 
that we want the work to be completed at this time. But honestly, based on uh, my own experience and my own department, uh, this is something that has been going on within my department. And uh, I like to set up, uh, you know, uh, interim deadlines when I'm working with a school because uh, that has been very, very helpful. And whenever I feel like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a school, I needed something, but the school needs some extra deadline to fulfill the task, then I'll eventually reach out to school and say, okay, based on this, you have this deadline again, two weeks extension, for instance. But I also need some room for myself to make sure, you know, if uh, for some reason there's an emergency and I, I didn't have enough time to review the work I'm supposed to do, then that's add up to what I'm supposed to complete. That's why I truly like this idea. But somebody raised uh, uh, a very important point here uh, when you say like, uh, if we move it to two years, and then perhaps that will prevent us from uh, looking back at uh, 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 2020, 2020 report. And the question I was having on that is to uh, try to find out whether uh, we only need to uh, 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 review three three years back rather than, you know, trying to combine, for instance, if we move to 2020, is it really a, a problem if we see go back to 2020 and adding that to, uh, you know, uh, 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 to those years uh, that we're supposed to, to miss? I was curious to, to understand how, how does it affect our work and if this is something uh, that truly uh, needs to be uh, 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 start only uh, uh, from 2020 and, uh, you know, uh, so, so just like now, if you look at 2020, right, 2020, we 2023, it means we'll be looking at the work from 2020 to 2023, and the report will be due when. Uh, to me, it's, it doesn't really make uh, any difference at all, uh, uh, switching the dates. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Novik. I really appreciate all of that, you know, sort of reinforcing that like there is practice, at least in your agency, of like setting interim due dates within statutory deadlines and that the agencies have responded, it sounds like, to that. And um, and I think that's my feeling. It's, you know, the more we're setting ourselves up to sort of handhold and support the covered agencies through these processes, you know, I think that they're going to lose something by not choosing to engage in that interim process um, to get to the end of that deliverable. So I, I, I think the more that we're engaging agencies in a way that's helping them fulfill their expectations, the easier it'll be to keep them on track with interim targets, um, sort of my instinct. But um, and then I'm also hearing a great question, which is statutorily, does the guidance for the benefit spending reports require that it's three the three years from when that guidance comes out? Or can we just pick the three year look back period we want the data to be so that even if we delay a year, we can still say we want 2020 through 2022 or whatever it would be data, Beeps, um, which I, is a great question. I can volunteer yeah. to take a closer look at that um, in terms of what flexibility we would have. So I can put that on my action item list and and get a crisp. Here's if there is no flexibility or here's kind of what kind of play out the scenario Jennifer had mentioned and that and then Uvik mentioned. I can take a look at that and share that with you. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. OK. All right, so I'm glad we've had this space to just sort of like see the information, hear this all together. Um, Mariana, you didn't miss anything. We're all just sort of like catching up at the same time. <laughs> um, just to answer your question from earlier, you know, of thinking this through. And so, you know, we will follow up, like Carla said, both on the earlier conversation with the per diems and with this more specifically, which approach now that we've laid out a couple more concrete options we want to take and just get some final feedback on that to be able to advocate. Um, the other sort of- Excuse me, Phoebs, Gail has proposal. her hand up. Oh yeah, go ahead. Gail? Sorry about that. Gail, did you? I'm trying. Can you hear me now? Yes. I just want us to take into consideration that this is a brand new committee 
And we lost time, it seems like more than six months, just by the per diem compensation not being included. And um, we've been spending a lot of time discussing an increase in rate, that taking up time. We've bypassed deliverables. I think that it's a responsible amount of time to ask for two years with the hopes that possibly just as a strategy, maybe we'll get an extension of a year. And my other question was um, already an was not answered, but it was about, can we only go back the three years when looking at the, um, <clears throat> the financial part of it? Thanks. Thank you, Gail. It's really great to hear your perspective. And yeah, thank you, Rachel, for offering to get us an answer to that question. And thank you, Carla, for noticing the hand that I missed. Um, OK, great. Yeah, so yeah, I appreciate the point of just um, strategically a two year extension might result in a the legislature coming back and saying one year only and better that than to say one year and then be told six months and then we're basically just compensating for the time we already lost and gaining ourselves no additional breathing room at that point so and i do think i i know i've said it already but the two years that we're asking for is really six months of lost time that already happened and then sort of an anticipated additional six months of resolving per diem and then a year of extra time built into relationship build, get contracts in place, set up engagement forums, translate materials, all those other things that we talked about are just just extremely difficult to keep up with at the current pace of the work. Um, I so yeah, like so I will mention, follow up. I would like to mention yeah, really quickly, thank you very much, Gail, for your feedback. Um, um, but I think in terms of the conversation that we're having, even though, uh, you know, the two year may end up being a one year, I think for purposes of the conversation, um, we should all um, assume that it will be a two year. And so think through those scenarios as you are providing, you know, your feedback and advice um, to us with regards to what to pursue and what not to pursue. Um, I just want to make sure that I communicate clearly that um, I, you know, in terms of the feedback, considering that the two year will be um, approved by the legislature is uh, something to consider. And then the option of perhaps if if two years seems um, not not reasonable for them, then, you know, that the fallback would be one year. But I think we should assume that the two year um, is the benchmark um, and then have a conversation about that. And then if we get the one year, then at least we know um, we know that uh, where we stood with regards to the two year. Um, Just curious from like a consensus temperature check if anybody's in sort of like a blocking position at this point around a two year extension um, request. Is anyone in sort of a stand aside position like I don't love it, but I'm not going to block it if that's what the majority decides they want to do. OK, I'm not trying to ask us to consent right now. It's just trying to get a feel. Yeah, I see a hand. Uh, yeah, just just check it. We actually don't even have quorum anymore for the advisory council. So as long as we're going to continue yeah. this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer, for pointing that out. Yeah, not trying to actually consent. Just kind of curious where for folks are in the room we're at. So yeah, so like I said, next step is follow up. Get the lay this out. Get kind of final feedback on it. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, our agency will sort of help advocate moving that through. Great. Um, the last thing that I had sort of put in this proposal, I uh, put as a proposal, um, in part because, so, you know, I, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that how these meetings get scheduled and coordinated how basically all the procedural si side of things you know um i think we talked a while back about would it help to have a steering committee 
what I'm realizing I would really appreciate um, to the extent that there is folks who have capacity is some sort of procedural justice committee that is attached to supporting both the interagency committee, but really the advisory council, um, just to help me think through the, on the proceeding side of our meetings, um, of the task groups that we're setting up, you know, in some ways as this gets more complicated, this web of how things are proceeding, just to help gut check that we are living up to the goal of procedural justice, which as defined by the Renews BIPOC Council is ensuring that directly impacted community members can engage in the processes of implementing this law in a way that enables them to take care of themselves in their communities versus feeling extractive, feeling like it's draining, feeling it's like just undermining the health and well-being of the very communities we're supposed to serve by even engaging in the process itself. Um, and there's more in that link that I have from the original Renew BIPOC Council's letter about procedural justice. But I just wanted to put out there that maybe something we could set up not to say, I'm not even necessarily not sure yet if you know it needs to be like super regular meetings, but just a group of folks from both bodies who'd be willing to just help advise me and think through those questions of procedural justice. Um, so I just want to put that out there, and I see Jennifer has a hand. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just something I've been thinking about. You know, the majority of the folks who are actually on the Renews BIPOC committee, who are also on the EJ Advisory Council aren't here today. And I've also heard uh, a, a, a few of them, but cer certainly Kai, I've heard her say a number of times that she much prefers in-person meetings, how she wants, like a lot of people want to show up that way. So um, that's just something, I don't know, it, it shouldn't cost too much money for us to host an in-person meeting. I know there's like facilitation. Uh, we don't have everything in place, but I've I've heard that said like a number of times. So that's, voices I feel are really missing. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. And I would reach out to Kaya explicitly to apologize that basically my capacity limit with losing Alex has put me in the position that it needed to be virtual or not at all at this stage, but the December meeting will be in person trying to get back on track. So that's that's been committed to. Um, and I'm still working out if for the advisory council sessions, if we can have an in-person space for that as well. So yeah, very much heard exactly the kind of things that help <laughs> think through um, and appreciate you just naming what our, what our, what Kaya needs to be present and frustrated. I am personally frustrated that that's been a hard thing to meet capacity wise and we'll be shifting that. So. Um, great. Well, I've planted the seed. I will, in the follow-up survey, ask if, if anyone would be interested in supporting that kind of committee and um, just to have a little bit more just accountability for myself, quite frankly, and making sure that, that you know, these proceedings feel like they are continuing to come back to the question of whether or not they really serve procedural justice or not. <sighs> okay, I think we did that. <laughs> Any of the last outstanding things? Okay, we talked about that too. Um, wow, all right. Well, we are woefully off schedule, um, but again, that was sort of predictable as I was putting together. I did the agenda first and then I put together the slides and I was like, there's no way, but here we are. Um, so I was just gonna say that's so bold, putting the that. time on there. I appreciate the aspirational. <laughs> At the end of the day, I want to honor the public comment periods, if nothing else. So, that, uh, those, so 340 is our next scheduled public comment period. So, um, you know, I'm going to just give a real quick kind of update here, um, like I did at the last meeting of just like, where are the things we are doing a lot? Where does that currently stand? Um, and just give you all a kind of quick little update on that. Um, and, and and I want to make sure I leave room for Rachel in particular to talk about a resource that she put together um, for you all to take home with you. So I'll kick off and I'll just stop at 340 and see if we have public comments. Um, just a reminder when I say major deliverables, um, you know, there's kind of these four, five major areas of work that I kind of see them all fitting into. We've got our community engagement. So we have our core principles and then the agency plans environmental benefits. So there's guidance on how to report for agencies to report on spending. Then the agencies do their three-year spending reports. Then ANR does a summary of the findings from those reports. And then 
agencies commit to changing, commit to uh, increasing, improving the distribution of those funds and actually start changing policies to achieve that. Um, we also have the EJ mapping tool, which is meant to really show where there's cumulative environmental burdens. There'll be rulemaking to define what a cumulative, what cumulative environmental burdens are and how they need to be considered in future permitting and decision making. Um, and then again, agencies sort of have to respond to that and change policy accordingly. We have our three annual agency reports that kind of come on on a rolling basis and then all three are every January every year from here on, which is civil rights and environmental justice issues, benefit spending reports and environmental justice action reports. And then we have sort of definition updates. Uh, every five years we're supposed to look at all the definitions, but short term it's really the EJ focused population that we're concerned about. Um, so in terms of what we've been working on recently on community engagement, just a reminder, we consented to draft four of the community engagement principles to move to a 45 day minimum public input period. So we're kind of at that stage of needing to have a concrete plan for how we want that public input period to look. Um, and then, you know, looking ahead, we want to make sure that we are thinking about how we want to guide cover agencies through their plan drafting proactively because I'm really concerned that just dropping a document on an agency and being like, good luck, is not going to get us the outcome that we're hoping to achieve. And so the more we can really think through what that's going to look like, the better off we'll be. Um, so that's really kind of still sitting with me um, to develop that in public input plan. And I'm going to really use the upcoming uh, breakout meetings of the Advisory Council and Interagency Committee to get into that question with you all in the weeds. I was hoping to start the conversation today, but um, we're not going to do that and that's okay. Um, so that's that bucket of work with the EGFP definition update. Um, in terms of making a recommendation to the legislature and, uh, we're, this is an example of where we're sort of leaning toward the, let's assume we're going to have some extra time to work on this. Um, we were originally asked asked to have a recommendation for a change to the definition complete by December of this year. Um, I think the takeaway from the presentation we got at our last meeting is that this is pretty technically complex and there's a lot of data to go through, a lot to consider. Um, there was a list of requests that came out of that meeting that uh, staff back at a &R, Rebecca Williams, who presented, Emily, who's on the call, um, Jamie Bates, they're all kind of working to put together some of those requests, one of which was sort of the legislative history of how we got to this current definition. And so um, I'm going to pause in a minute and let Rachel speak to what she put together about that. Um, so yeah, so really where I'm at is thinking about having a task group more formally put together that can really help guide a thoughtful process of getting all of us to think through with public input, whether or not this definition should change, and if so, what that should look like, um, and try to have a recommendation for the 2025 session if that feels necessary at that point, because we might say we like the current definition, and that's fine too. Um, so that would give us time to, for example, build a health indicator if that's something we actually think needs to be a fourth variable that defines EJ focus. That's not happening in two months. Um, that takes time and a lot of insight and work. Um, and so I've been talking to Amy about how do we get some of the staff from the Department of Health on this task group to help us, all of us, think through that piece. How do we set up some more learning sessions for all of us to get into the data and to better understand it? How do we get folks in the room like Annette, who spoke earlier, who's saying, hey, I'm not sure your definition really lines up with how I'm seeing environmental justice play out in communities. Are we going to miss people with this definition? Those are exactly the kind of public input questions and feedback we need to be receiving and then looking at and processing. Um, so those are the sorts of things I'd like to see really have a thoughtful process unfolding over the coming year um, so that we can make a recommendation for the 2025 session. So that's where that's at. Um, welcome feedback on that approach. And then um, Rachel, if you'd like, um, I welcome you to just talk through the guide that you put together just so folks can take that resource home with them. Oh, sure. 
I'll just be I'll be quick about it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of reintroduce myself as a a place to get some support. So if you have questions about finding a bill or if you're trying to find a recording or something on the you can certainly just email Phoebes or email me and I can send you the links. Um, I'll probably I put together kind of a little overview with some with some versions of the draft definitions and to show how those changed over time. But I could certainly if folks wanted a deeper dive on any of the other topics, like how did the thinking about environmental burdens change over time, I can certainly put those kind of materials together. But I also just wanted to show folks, if you've never tried to access um, the legislative history, how you can find it yourself and, and watch recordings, as Phoebe's mentioned, um, you know, they were looking at some previous testimony or recordings or kind of some really interesting witness documents and materials. Um, and that's all online. That could be part of our, you know, all building our shared understanding of of the topic and, and what we're thinking about it. Um, I don't know, Phoebes, do you want me to, do you want to share your screen just to show what it looks like? Or, I mean, folks can click on it. Um, I have a, I'll just give an overview. I have a quick kind of 101 kind of guide, like how to find the website. I put the links in there, how to actually uh, search for the law, um, you know, just to make it more confusing. The law has many different numbers attributed to it. Um, so I've put those in the guide so you can kind of, you know, you may hear it referred to as Act 154. You may hear it referred to as um, S-148 and trying to kind of, understand what that means and how you can find information online. Um, and then, as I said, I kind of did a little snapshot of the of the definition of environmental justice population or focus population and how that changed over time. So you can take a look at the bill that was introduced um, by Senator Keisha Rahm Hensdale uh, and then see how that uh, changed um, with some witness testimony over time and to see where we landed. Um, so I just want to invite you to, as you have time to take a look at that, but also to feel free to ask me if you have, hey, I'd really love to see, um, you know, any discussion on the on the the funding and how that changed over time. And I can send you the links to information that you could you can track down yourself as well. So um, just trying to make that information more accessible to folks who were not a part of the um, environmental justice law being created the first time. So. Welcome. Any questions about that? Encourage folks to take a look at it. Feel free to send me an email. Go ahead, Mariana. Yeah, it's just wanted to make sure that um, I'm not sure if Rachel was um, scheduled to walk us through this document today a little bit. But if that's the case, that'll be great if we have an opportunity later in the future so that we don't have to digest all the documents by ourselves. And yeah, and yeah I'm sure to, the, that ties nicely to the idea that we need more time for everything. So <laughs> here we go. Yeah. I guess I do yeah. defer um, to you, Phoebes. I don't want to bleed into I, public comment time. I think so. we do have some, I think we have time if you want to do an intro, but I want to pause just because we did say 340 public comment period. So I'd like to just take a hard stop, check in and see if we have any members of the public who wanted to check in and then um, and then I'd be happy to take sort of the end of the meeting to um, sort of look at that guide and finish up this update. But yeah, anybody from the public wanted to comment at this stage? Okay. All right. Then, yeah, let me real quick just finish these last couple real quick last bucket of update and then let's use the end of the time if you Rachel, if that feels like enough to to actually walk through the document so folks can get a little head start using yeah, it and it's then we can wrap short. up. And I'm okay. happy to stay, stay on a little bit if needed. Okay. So, yeah, so we can do that, Mariana. Thank you for asking. Um, great. So that was on the definition update piece. Um, although the guide that Rachel was talking about really can inform any of the work we're doing together. Um, and then the last area that I just wanted to acknowledge that we've been working on is environmental benefit spending reports. Um, in particular, you know, the first step in that is A&R is responsible for creating guidance for the covered agencies to send their three, to develop their three-year spending reports. Um, so, what we've done is set up a task group that is mostly ANR staff, since we're sort of the lead 
responsible party. Um, but we've also opened and invited advisory council members um, to be part of that. And so Jennifer uh, has been really present in those meetings. Zariah has been guiding those meetings and, um, you know, that remains an open invitation for folks. Um, and what that group's been working on over the last two months or so is um, a guide for us to think through what needs to go into this guidance for the covered agencies. So um, the same way we did the guide to the core engagement principles, which was sort of a document that was like, what is this deliverable all about? And what does the law say it needs to require? And like, OK, so what should what should we all be thinking about to put this together? Right. It's sort of a, a guide to writing the guidance. Um, and there's, you know, in particular, a set of questions that we're trying to answer as a task group, including things like what should the three year look back period be? So we just got a whole bunch of information today that we're going to take back and, and think through in that section. Um, yeah, the guide to the guide. It's so brutal. Um, so anyway, that guide is done. And our whole goal with as a task group was that that guide could really help create some transparency with all of you about what it is that we are doing and writing so that, um, you know, y'all can give us some thoughts about, are these the right questions? Who do you think we should bring to the table to answer these questions? Um, any suggestions on how to make it more accessible for stakeholders to engage in uh, answering these questions with us? Um, and also just sort of, you know, as you look at the guide, what relationship do you want, want with this task group? Like, oh, I want to get more in the weeds and in the details with you all, or I'm good with a report out every once in a while. Um, so I, I again, in the follow up that we're going to do after this meeting, I can ask you these questions um, and give you a minute to sort of sit with them and think without them. I did want to plug with interagency committee members that we as a task group feel pretty strongly it would help to kind of pilot draft iterations of this guidance with some different programs or business staff across different agencies to be like, all right, this makes sense from an ANR perspective, but would this make any sense to the data people at education? Would this make sense to the data people at the Public Utility Commission? So it'd be really helpful for us to maybe identify, you know, how we can work with you all as we go through the drafting phase so that we have a set of guidance that once it gets to the agencies, We've already kind of vetted and made sure it makes sense and, and will work in practice. So, um, yeah, so that that's the last bit of just sort of update on some of what we've been working on. And, um, you know, I think my punchline with this update was simply going to be that we're going to need community engagement and input all along the way with all of these pretty technical things that we're working on. And so we just really need to get ahead of the question of what do we want that to look like in practice. So yeah, so I will stop and see if there's any just questions about that update um, or comments at this stage. And then otherwise happy to kind of give the rest of our time over to Rachel to walk us through this guide that she put together. Great. So I'm going to stop sharing. Would it help, Rachel, if I shared my screen of the guide? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. And I I just want to recognize to um, Megan and Emily and the rest of the team that helped pull this together. I definitely I was amazed that it looks so formal and professional <laughs> because it was so well formatted. Uh, so I appreciate that made it a lot more accessible. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I'll just walk through and I guess as a um, a starting point. So this this question of legislative history came up at the last meeting um, because folks have been interested in kind of what like what was the legislature thinking when they wrote this um, or answering the question like, wow, how did that definition get to look like that? Where did it evolve? Was that you know, did a community recommend that or did somebody amend that? Um, same, you know, some other questions have come up, like, why is it so underfunded? Like, when did that change? Um, and so it is kind of hard to answer that question because it's capturing what was, you know, just hundreds and of hours and days and meetings of time um, and discussion at the legislature. Um, but 
this is an attempt to kind of at least get you into the place where we can start to answer those questions. And certainly um, we have the benefit of some folks that are here that participated in the process and can help illuminate some things. And I can certainly try to provide more um, specific, you know, uh, details about uh, items if if you have questions. Is that very zoomed out for folks? Can you see that? Is it readable? Okay. Um, I, I would zoom in more. Yeah. Yeah, it looks kind of small to me. Phoebs. Is that? Oh, that's did better. that change? <laughs> no, it's okay. zoomed in. Just very yeah. delayed. Okay. No, great. that's okay. Um, so the starting point is really the website for the Vermont General Assembly. General Assembly is kind of the formal name for the Vermont legislature, um, which is a branch of our government. And so you can find the, you know, a ton of information on their website. So that's the first link that I recommend you go to. Um, this is a great resource for finding historical information, but also tracking changes to laws, um, you know, during the legislative session, which will start in January. So starting to become familiar with this website might be really helpful as you think about how to engage or to track uh, initiatives that you're interested in, or certainly, you know, when I'm tracking a, a change to a law, I'm I'm almost on this website, you know, throughout the day, all day. <laughs> so um, just want to mention that to you. Um, another thing I mentioned here, as you can see that um, Vermont laws have a lot of different names and numbers assigned to them, depending on where they are in the process. So you may hear somebody say law, the EJ law, um, you may also hear someone say statute, essentially that those terms refer to the official um, law that has been codified, meaning it's passed the legislature, it's been signed by the governor, and it's actually been codified in the code of laws for the state. Um, and that is the statute number. And for Vermont, you can see the statute is 3 VSA chapter 72. You can click right into the, into the law itself. Um, before or, or before it's codified, but once a law has passed the legislature and is signed by the governor, it gets what's called an act number. Um, an act is also the law of the land. It just hasn't been codified in the code. It hasn't been given a number. And so um, you can see the act number for that we refer to commonly, the, the law here is Act 154. Um, you might be asking, what's the difference? Why would I want to read one versus the other? Well, there's a lot more text in the act itself than there is in the codified statute. It's a very wonky, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it's called session law. Um, and there's a whole, for example, a set of findings that you can find seven pages of legislative findings um, related to the purpose of the law in the act that you can't find if you access it using the statute number. I don't tell don't ask me why, <laughs> but the findings are, you know, not the legal like codified requirements. They're they're something called session law. And, and you can find that by clicking on the act. Um, and then also the bill, um, which was the the it had a bill number for Senate Bill 148 uh, before it was passed by the legislature. That was the bill number that it was assigned. And so when you're seeing references to the bill or different drafts, um, at the legislature, it'll be referred to as S-148. Uh, I know it's confusing and I am sorry about that. Um, another important piece is the, the legislative session number. Um, so you want to make sure, and uh, there's a slide here to show you if you scroll down, Phoebs. When you're on the website, you're automatically looking at all the information for this current session. Um, and so if you want to look in the past, it's kind of like looking in the Wayback Machine on Google, if you want to look in the past, if you could, there might just be a delay. You need to change the session number on the website, which should be the next page. There you go. It's coming. Sorry. So no, you're slow. fine. So just want to note, you know, if you search for S148 and it does not appear, that means you're not in the right session. I know, again, added complications, but just make sure that you've changed your session number to reflect 2021 and 22 session, which is when the bill was debated by the legislature and considered. Um, you can keep scrolling down. Okay, what can you find when you go to this website? Um, 
there's all kinds of information. And again, it could be overwhelming, but hopefully could be also interesting. There are uh, since COVID, post COVID, there are YouTube video recordings of all of the the meetings of the legislative sessions that considered um, the bill. So if you can find, you know, the first thing is to find what day did the committee or which committee and what day did they discuss a certain topic. Um, and then once you can find that on their schedule, then you can view the recording of that day and to watch how the you know, how the discussion unfolded or how a witness testified. Now, this is tricky to find, and so this is why I've offered to find it for you. So if you are looking for, hey, I really want to know when they heard from the University of Vermont on this topic, um, you know, d there was like a thesis that was presented. Can you find that? Just feel free to shoot me an email and I'll send you the recording so you don't have to spend a ton of time on here, but this is if you wanted to find it yourself, you can click on these tabs. There's a com committee activity tab that will show you who testified on what day. So there's a whole list of witnesses and it tells you when when you can um, when you can search what days they testified. For example, Jennifer Byrne, one of our esteemed <laughs> colleagues here, you can click on uh, her on the witness list and you can see all the days and dates that she testified and then you can view those recordings if you're interested. You can also find uh, there's a documents tab and again I've linked everything here so you can you can use this guide yourself uh, on your own time um, and you can find the presentations that were submitted or any documents or records that were submitted with that witness. That can be very helpful. Um, you can also see all the drafts of the bill. Now, this may not be helpful because a lot of times they look the same and sometimes the changes are very subtle, so it might not mean anything. Um, some of the most important versions that people are usually interested in is what did it look like when it was introduced? So what was the bill that, for example, Senator Rahm had, uh, introduced? What did it look like at that time? What was the bill version that was passed out of the Senate? And what was the bill version passed out of the House? And were there any you know, concessions made among the major bodies? So there were some differences between those three big versions, those three drafts, and you can review those. There's also detailed uh, differences, um, but again, it, it can be a little hard to suss out. Like, And, and certainly we're just looking for um, information that can help in your decision making and thinking as you're considering you know, other changes to the bill you might wanna make uh, in the future. You can scroll down. Feel free to stop me if this if this is too abstract, but we can keep. The next, I'll just talk ahead. Oh, there we go. Um, so I used all those tools that I just showed you in the guide to give an example of how the EJ focus population definition changed over time. Um, so as you can see, the original bill, um, this was the text. Uh, there was not actually a definition of environmental justice focused population or EJ population in the original bill. Um, this was the requirement. It it had a as listed as one of the duties of the advisory council, uh, the requirement, it kind of put it on the council to identify and define what was called environmentally distressed communities. Um, based on a variety of factors, including geographic, socioeconomic, demographic, public health and environmental hazard criteria. Um, and it was kind of not meant to, at least original in the original proposal, it didn't have a definition baked into the statute. And then you can see over time, there was a definition proposed based on demographic indicators. If you can't tell what you're seeing on the screen, but um, so what I think is really interesting is, and you can watch this testimony of when they, when the committees considered an addition of a definition. Um, I don't think I have the links in this version. I can send those to you, Phoebs, to update, but um, that was discussed on January 21st. These new definitions were considered. There's a presentation uh, introducing that definition, which you can find online. Um, there was also in February a version of the bill that included a petition process uh, for community members to petition to be considered an EJ focused population and then that was later removed. 
Um, and again, this may just be helpful as you're as you're weighing any changes to the to the definition or considering um, you know how things evolved over time. Um, certainly, what the law is now is what is in the is what is in the statute, which we're all familiar with. Um, and then something else we talked about is there was a lot of really interesting discussion about census data and the use of data as part of the mapping tool. Um, so I did add some links to recordings from the DEC and some other folks about, um, you know, testimony that was heard by the committees about the definition and the data to be used. So some of these recordings um, or testimony might be of interest to folks here. So um, I'll continue to update this with topics that are of interest if if folks want to see an evolution of anything, but just wanted to offer this as a way to kind of provide some transparency and um, show folks it, how they, if they want to do a deep dive, how you could begin to approach that in your research. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Rachel. Really appreciate you giving us tools to catch up and there is so much to catch up on constantly. Um, the learning curve is fierce um, with you all. <laughs> um, this is all new for me too, so it's it's really helpful. Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, it's four o'clock. This has been a long three hour meeting. We covered a ton of content. Um, we didn't get to everything we wanted to. That's as expected, but it, I think we covered a lot of important grounds and I really hope that y'all can just sort of like soak in, sleep on, ruminate on what we've talked about. And then, you know, so that we get this follow up survey out there, we can really kind of hone in on what our approach is going to be collectively. And I'll make it a point to reach out to folks who couldn't be here today to make sure I hear their sort of perspective since they couldn't be in the dialogue with us. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for your ongoing support and commitment 